All right, this is a freebie for everybody. So the Flex Outdoor Unit, we talked about the fusible plug, which is a pain in the butt. Um, so just the other day, Greg reached out to me. He was looking for the, the overload, compressor overload. And so he's looking at the schematic and he calls me and he's like, hey man, I can't figure out which compressor overload goes on this flex. And I'm sitting here going, uh, it should be the same one as fits everything else. All the overloads are the same. There's three different part numbers and uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. They're the same, it's just different vendors. And um, so we get to look in a little bit further into it and it occurred to us that it has a fusible plug. Why does it have a fusible plug? So somebody did come top back side. They, top back side of the compressor? That's what they said. All right. They didn't say well, of the compressor, just said top We appreciate the attempt. Yeah, at, we do. At least. So, um, don't feel like the, the Lost Ranger here. So, <laughs> we, we've been into this one. We've been dealing with the Flex for how many years oh, now? <laughs> I've been dealing with it, I know. Three for years. Four <laughs> years, three, four years at least. So, on the compressor, if you take the, let's see here. Hang on. Did you pop something? Yeah. It is powered up. It, it gave us an H5. Cool. You got them wires exposed, didn't you? I know. I didn't know you was going to be doing that. <laughs> Goofball. <laughs> this is what you yeah. don't do in a training class. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So, I already had it peeled back where you can see it from the top side. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it's okay. Just to spoil the fun, there is no compressor overload. There is definitely no compressor overload. There is overload. no compressor overload. Greg already took off the cap and exposed the wires on top of the compressor, and there's nothing there. And I didn't so. show Daniel, and then the power was still on. Yeah, so he's that's moving okay. things around without that's me okay. knowing about it. It's it's all good. So um, <laughs> see, this is why we train on our equipment and not somebody else's, because now we get the fun of if this thing's damaged, fixing it. That was that was good. Turn it back on. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it back on and see if H5 went away. H5 is gonna go away. Zero zero. EVs are clicking. Cool. So. Good to go. I don't know what I touched under there because the the compressor wires are covered really well. But anyways, that aluminum on that compressor blanket. But anyway, so we learned something new is that there is no overload on the compressor. So I'm going to move on to indoor fan setup. We're going to talk about this uh, on the indoor unit. So. We've got an eight-speed ECM motor, and this goes back to our discussion that Greg and I were having about the control board. We don't need one inch of static, static on any unit. Well, even though the blowers are rated up to one inch of static, that's not what you want to do with an ECM motor no. is have it at that top end. So your sweet spot is going to be somewhere between about a 0.4 and a 0.6 total static. That's really where I want to be. Also keep in mind, with flex product and being an inverter-driven unit, we don't need to move 400 CFM per ton. Mm -hmm. If you're doing 325 to 350 CFM per ton, it's fine. you're fine. So Daniel's going to kind of talk about the dip switch settings and the blower charts, but that's how you utilize those two together. So we get into that 325, 350 CFM per ton at a, at a good static, somewhere yeah. between 0.4 and 0.6, and that should mitigate should mitigate blower issues. Yeah. So on the, uh, on the B revision, the heat dip switches are the only ones adjusted. The cool dip switches need to remain on. It's just labeled that. That's just, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that your fan's gonna do something different in heat versus cool. It's a single set speed that you have to set up when you install this thing. Well, the I mean, default, if, you, if you think about it there too, you're running on Y. Y and G. G is your fan, Y is your heat pump. Whether you're in cooling or heating mode. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't so we really need to run at the same speed anyway. Right. So the default for all air handler speeds, this is incorrect. Um, 
the four and five ton are set for speed six, I believe, from the factory. That's changed once or twice. So, but it doesn't matter. You have to set it up. There is no factory fan setting. It has to be set up for the particular application that you've installed it for or into. So <clears throat> here's the, the board, here's the dip switches. You'll see uh, on the two ton, uh, none of the cool switches or SA1. And we noticed on the Flex Eco, they took away the word heat and cool, which is fine with me because it confused everyone. SA1 is, they're all the same. SA2 is the only ones you're changing and they have to be in one of these uh, sequences in order for it to be speed one, speed two, speed three, speed four, and so on. There's a little bit better um, blow up of the dip switches there. You can see them a little bit better on the slides. You're the system need needs to be off as with anything in order to change a dip switch and the setting actually take effect. The system must be powered down. The white square indicates the switch position. You'll notice that across the different ones between the four ton speed one, the five ton speed one, you have a different uh, setup for those speeds. Now here's the indoor uh, fan performance. So flex 24 um, at speed one with 0.15 static, you've got 840 CFM. And then on the three on the three ton um, speed one point one five static nine hundred fifty cfm and so on so anywhere that you're off of the chart means you're off the chart you can't do that and we honestly want to avoid that we don't need with one inch of static you're not fixing improper ductwork you're making noise you're making it annoying for the customer so. The Greeflex cannot fix improper ductwork. This is a great example of improper ductwork. If you'll notice on the slide, that is a wooden plenum. It's barely even a plenum because it's made out of two by fours. So we've got two by fours and a piece of plywood and then two ducts cut into it. I'm not sure in what world that makes any good sense or would work properly. This is a great situation where you're going to have a blower shut down. It's going to be pretty awful. So always take into account what are the CFM requirements or limits of the ductwork. If you're installing, let's say for instance, you go to a customer's house, ah, it's always been hot upstairs in the summertime and the thing never keeps up. Fine, we'll throw you in a four ton instead of the three ton that you got now. It'll work great. And they don't take the time to make sure that the ductwork is adequate for that four ton it's not going to work properly and it goes back to it's not a matter of the motor being a problem it's not a matter of the equipment being a problem the matter is is that there's a problem regardless of what brand or type of equipment that you install that will always be there the greed just happens to have limits set within it within the programming to protect itself instead of a year later of motor burning out. The problem with that is, is within a week or two and you have a blower shut down, it makes it look like the contractor did a bad job. Well, the question is, is that true? If it's true, then we have to address it. We can't replace motors and replace equipment assuming that it's the equipment all the time. All right, let's move over to the air handler and take a look at the static pressure on this particular thing. Um, oh, I forgot, I promised to share this with everybody inside. So here is the, and this is hot, right? It is hot. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the Molex plug. It's normally sitting right here. So you can plug your heater kit in. Um, but you can see we have the pigtail attached to the incoming power wire. There is no L1, L2 on the terminal block. And you can just unplug this and plug the heat kit into it if you're going to provide power in that direction or have a heat kit. So, so just to clarify too, this is for demonstration purposes. 
we don't have the power capability coming to the air handler to supply. Right. We put a 5KW heat kit in it, but we don't have enough power for it. Right. But we went ahead and put the heat kit in it just for demonstration purposes. That's why we don't have it plugged in off the heat kit. We have it plugged in off the pigtail picking up the power. But as Daniel was saying, here's an older version where it shows the L1 and L2 separate connection. Yeah. They, this is what Daniel was talking about. They got away from that. We, they, they did what we asked them to do, which is make that Molex plug that goes to the heater kit also give us some Molex pigtail. plug pigtail coming off of it. So if you're going to, you got to do one or the other. It doesn't give you the ability to have both anymore. Right. So that's what has been done Problem in solved. this instance. So, yeah. And we just changed this air handler out yesterday so that we could show the new setup to everything. Yeah. And we pulled that out of the old air handler that was here. This is the old Avery Vision, but the same thing, just to show you, you know, this is the way it used to be. We got rid of that. This is where we are today. Yep. Yep. So. So. All right. So um, we're going to start this thing up and check our static. So in, if you want to explain a little bit about where we have this located, thank you for going in and setting this up. Um, I like how you've got your meter holding. Yeah, I was, the, I was cheating. Holding the manometer tube there. All right. So I put it on heat mode. Let's let's mount it like right. Yeah, so he can see it. So, what we did here, just so you know, and I'll and I'll grab one of these to show you. You know, to do static pressure properly, we really should be using static pressure probes. And mine are older, and the arrow wore off, but I redrew new arrows on it, so it actually shows. You know, your arrow pointing the way your probe is. Because your probe should be, you know, forced, you know, pointed toward the airflow. So in the supply, this would be pointed down exactly the way I had it. And Daniel made an interesting point when we did this once before. Make sure you're getting it in the air stream, not way on the front of the plenum or the back of the plenum. We want to be more centered in that plenum when you're putting your air probe in. Right. And then this one... The return's all forced in through the front, even though we got it blocked off. All the return comes in the front, so we turn the arrow that way. And then the other thing that I want a stickler about is you always want to zero your meter out. Oops. On. Zero your meter out. Then hook up your probes to get an accurate reading. And mine's reading negative when it's a differential and it's only because of the way I have the vacuum hoses. So if I do them properly, all right. So now our total static on this system is at 0.37, but we got the return almost completely blocked off, but we have no supply plenum at all. So it's not a real world example, but it gives you the idea. But this is where I see guys mess up is they don't actually, they take multiple readings and they're not zeroing their meter out between and that can cause problems with your readings. So you, right. anytime they're retaking a reading, they should be pulling their hoses off, zero the meter, hook the hoses back up and get an accurate reading. Now I don't, um, hopefully Nick can zoom in on, on the meter here so you can see the reading, but also next to it, you'll see, and this was a, brand new stock that we just ordered down here specifically for this week so we ordered this flex 36 bh down here and we do have uh the qr code that says stop for blower setup all they have to do is scan it and this takes them to the quick start guide and it's got all the information that they need to do the uh, outdoor and indoor setup for your fan and your tonnage for the dip switches outside. All of that information's in the quick start guide. Uh, it's got your low voltage wiring in there as well. Um, actually was kind of funny to me when we, when we switched over to selling the flex, how many calls I got about low voltage. Yeah, and it amazes me it, to this day. I was just so amazed because for me it was always 
okay, I get it. I'm dealing with inverters. They're new. You know, nobody really understands them. And then we went back to using 24 volt control and people called about, you know, how do I wire up 24 volt control? And I'm sitting here going, I thought you guys knew this part. <laughs> but anyways, it's in the quick start guide now. So it makes Well, it and easier. I actually think it's because we're dealing with a lot of younger guys still that, you know, they may have been in the field even several years, but they're more used to gas heat and stuff. Yeah. And they're just not yeah. as familiar with heat pump and heat pump wiring. I mean, I know people in the field that have been doing this for 20, 25 years. You put them in front of a heat pump, and they're lost. Right. So, you know, maybe that's the reason why we get so many questions about wiring of heat pumps and stuff, too. So, yep. um, so. I was trying to trick this thing out and close off the blower a little bit more with a little piece of metal. As long as oh, it doesn't go one? flying off of here. Can we even put this back or leave it on? No, put it back. Okay. I right, said so we don't have. Now I got point four five. We're not really, we're not really able. You know, you don't have a full pressurized duct system. So even what we're to doing what's here really going on. is really not real yeah. world. But yeah. Anyway. But still it gives you an idea. You know, you close it off some. Yeah. Static pressures went up a little bit. So. So you know, we want to take that static pressure. Look at our blower chart. Look at the fan speed settings and what we should be getting. Target 325 to 350 CFM per ton, and then set the dip switches for that blower speed. So um, on the slides, I think we covered that pretty well. So um, this is out of the quick start guide regarding the outdoor dip switches. Um, the quick start guide gives you all your indoor setup too. It does. It's got your blower, your your indoor fan, and all that. I think I already zoomed past that on the slides. So, so a few questions came in. I'm going to go ahead yeah. and read yeah. these off. Uh, so Gardner was Supply New England. Would like to have a way to look at errors in history. Unfortunately, the flux doesn't doesn't hold the error codes. No, it doesn't. So, and I don't, the Gree's not going to be doing that as far as I know. Uh, what is the default speed setting? We talked about that already. Uh, it looks like, what is it, you said two and three ton is? Well, it's not default. It, it's, it's default is four, I think, and then. Yeah, for the two and three ton, it's four. For the five ton, it's six. Four and five ton is six. Right. But, but like again, you said, the, the point is that it's not a factory setting. You it's just a default set it setting. Up. It's, it's not a proper it's, setting. It's just what it's at. Right. It needs to be reviewed and adjusted if necessary. If you fall on that blower chart, if you fall right, on, right in at speed four with your static and, and how many CFM per ton you're targeting, 325 to 350, then you won't have to adjust anything. But if you're outside of that range, you've got to adjust it. So then they also asked if we can show just our return, and we can. I need to zero this out. So just on the return, I don't know if my meter is just playing games or what. That is the return, right? Yeah. Can't imagine that not having more pull on it than that. Uh, Point two. There, there go. it goes. Point two seven. Yep. And if I actually put that on the right terminal, <laughs> it should show it, it negative. Negative. Oh yeah, it's actually higher than Point that. Point five now. Yeah. Negative point five nine. And we got it almost completely blocked. So. Yeah. So that's something that I like to talk about too. So, you know, I've told guys before, there is, there is advantages to measuring separately and not doing just your differential because it may, in turn, tell you what's wrong. Right. If, if, you, if you have a high return but your, your supply is fine, then but you have a direction to go. The caution that I have to that is if I have a high return static, keep in mind the blower can only push 
And I think it's actually more the negative point two seven. What again, bull? I think the hose was getting pinched over here. Ah. Uh, I got some really old hoses. Anyway, but the blower can only push what it can pull. So if it can't, if your return's too restrictive, so you may measure your supply and it's point one, which is which is adequate, you know, and then you measure return and it's point seven. That would tell you, okay, my return is the problem. But once you fix that return, now the supply is Recheck a good supply. possibility it's going to go up because right. of the fact that maybe that ductwork wasn't sized right. Now you could have actually just had a problem on the return side. Your supply side was was piped, you know, ducted properly. But maybe maybe we had a flex and the flex was collapsed or something. Yeah. And now we fixed yeah. that and now my return's good. Uh, I've also used it in gas furnaces where I will take I will take the differential just across the coil because it'll tell you whether or not that coil is clogged. Because right. all your coils, your air handler, same as Gree has it, your evaporator coils, they all have a static tr static pressure drop across them that's listed by the manufacturer. So if you got a three ton coil, they're they're saying at twelve hundred CFM you should have this much drop across that coil. If you have more wet, than that, wet and dry, right? Right. And if I had significantly more than that then I know it's either froze <laughs> or, or it's filthy dirty, right? right. So, the, you know, if you teach that to your guys in trainings and stuff like that and talking to them on the phone, they'll, they'll quickly learn that, that doing static pressure this readings can, can save, save them, them a lot, lot of, of aggravation on servicing versus units. Versus tearing on the field. this thing apart and pulling the coil exactly. out to look or, or sticking your head in there and shining a flashlight up into it. Just use this, and then you kind of have the a worst one I ever seen in the field. I was it should have been about a point three total drop, and I was getting point seven five across the coil. <laughs> and then when I got into the coil, yeah, it was completely carpet coated in dog hair. <laughs> so you had a carpet. So I know it works, you know. And that's the same thing here. As long as we are doing our static pressure measurements and setting our dip switches right and getting that blower running in that sweet spot that I was telling you about. Yeah. Keep in mind, again, 325 to 350 CFM per ton. That's where I want to be. As long as you get that the static right, you shouldn't be seeing blower motor shutdowns. Right. Now, the other thing you got to keep in mind, too, is when they're doing this, and this is something else I tell contractors all the time when I do training for contractors. Hey, before you do this, don't overlook the obvious. Walk through the house. Make sure the returns are not blocked. Mm -hmm. Make sure all the registers, sure registers are open. Are open. <laughs> Make sure that you're ready to do a study. You don't have couches and rugs over all the registers. We always get the zero-minded <laughs> effect, right? So yeah. they install the unit. All they've focused on What's is this? where they're right putting here. the air handler in, where they're setting yeah. the condenser. They've never walked around and looked at registers and ductwork yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's a good idea for, you know what, let's take a take a little break and walk through the house and see what's happening just make sure you know we're ready to do those other right. tests right. so because <laughs> it's easily done you know i've seen people and we know elderly folk are, are guilty of it and maybe one of these <laughs> days i'll be guilty of it you always but, you know, close that i'm not using off. this room i'm not using that room i'm not using that room so they close all the registers yep. what they don't know is they don't realize is that system's designed to dirt to deliver a quantity of air and you've just cut off one third of the ductwork. Yep. So, you, you know, and I've even, and I've taken the calls and got on the phone, hey, hey, have you walked through the house and made sure all the registers are open? No, I ain't done that. Well, let's do that. <laughs> because we, we may be ready to condemn Marking ductwork issues, tree. and it's just a matter yeah. of fact that the registers ain't open. Yeah. Do they have any dampers in the system? Do they have manual dampers in the system? Which are sometimes hard to find. And sometimes they are hard to find. So, you know, another thing to keep in mind when we're when we're doing this on the flex outdoor unit we were talking about the uh, dip switch settings and we'll go go through those now keep in mind this is uh on the quick start guide so the quick starts guide um includes the blower setup that we talked about yesterday um you know we talked about the manometer and taking static pressure and setting the fan speed and setting the the dip switches for the fan speed um, we talked about the blower charts located in the quick start guide um, did notice something yesterday and i believe i pointed it out but if i forgot to 
the QR code coming on the BH uh, indoor unit now that takes you directly to the page with the blower setup and the quick start guide. Um, and uh, uh, was there anything else that we've... Well, the one thing I want to make sure I point out, because I just took a call the other day from a contractor on a flex unit, and he was com completely confused on the thermostat wiring and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went working off of a, your computer file quick start guide. It really wasn't that long ago, probably less than 30 days ago. That, that we, we updated it, yeah. We updated it and added all the thermostat wiring diagrams yes. to the quick start guide. So make sure you're letting your contractors know that as well, because... You know that makes it pretty clear cut how to how to wire these things up. Yeah, you it could save got, you some faint phone calls. Same a lot of we're phone getting, calls um, regarding wiring of the flex. It's so. everything that they need aside from you know the submittal and the breaker sizes and you know all the different things like that. It's everything they need once this is installed to yeah, start it up. I think it's it what less than twenty pages or less something. Than, it makes it really simple. I think it's like ten pages now. Well. It was around eight pages, and we added the three. I don't know if we did three separate pages for the diagrams. But realistically, but realistically it's, it's, it's a short document. Yeah. They don't have to go through a whole service manual. They don't have to go through a whole set of installations, instructions. We set it up. It's all 100% in English and easy to understand. And uh, and then while, we're, while I'm talking about it, too, I may make mention of this, too, because we said to get that phone call. Um, uh, there seems to be some confusion in some of the contractors I talked to that when you have a heat pump, the minute that mode switch is put to heat, that's what energizes the reversing valve. That Which reversing turn, valve will stay energized the entire time the system switch is on heat. So then it'll go to the outdoor unit, as Daniel was getting ready to point out, the outdoor unit will say on because the reversing zero, valve zero. is energized. Yep. Any 24 volt call to that board tells yes. that machine to say it says on, but the unit will may not be running. The only thing that's going to make it run is Y. Is a Y call. Yeah. yeah. And then also want to clear up one other thing and make sure everybody understands that Daniel had talked about it yesterday, as far as not breaking R with a condensate float or any other safety for that matter. R is brought out to this machine for one purpose and one purpose only. That is for the 24 volt signal back during defrost. It has nothing to do with killing power to this unit. Yeah. This board is powered off the line voltage power. Right. It's not powered off the 24 volt power. It doesn't need that, which an is arm. very different than any other heat pump you'd ever yeah. work on. A lot of times they it are is. powered by the 24 volts. These are powered by the 230 volts. And any any inverter uh, outdoor unit that you deal with is probably going to be the same way. You're going to have to break Y. You know I've Growing up with dad in down, so if you're used right. and, and you and you, you wire that one, this one up that way, or any other inverter outdoor unit, it's probably kill it. So that outdoor is going to continue running, and you know it, it doesn't. It has no way after that to, to know to shut down because right. you killed R. So right. um, yeah, also points, one other thing too, because uh, we get this question. Um, what if we don't have enough wires? We installed the flex, but we really only want it to run as an air conditioner. You can do that. All you need is Y and C. Yep. It'll run. It'll it runs in cool go. mode because yeah. you, you have to energize reversing valve in heat mode for it to run in heating. So right. if they got Y and C, they can run it. If they don't care about defrost, all you need is Y, C, and B, yep. and it'll run in heat pump heating mode. Yep. So you don't have to have R out here for this machine yeah, you don't, to function. You don't have to use the D terminal. It right. doesn't care if you use D to shut down the fan, control the fan, or control the emergency heat on the indoor. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So the, the key thing to remember about this is we're dealing with 24 volts control. So we can do whatever we want to within 24 volt control abilities. Correct. It doesn't, it's not going to... Uh, not be able to hook up to a dual fuel, um, you know, things like that. If you want to add a, a cutoff uh, relay or whatever to cut the, right. shut the system down or, or, you know, anything like that, it's 24 volt control, so you can do that with it. So, so we'll go back. I didn't mean to get off on a tail. No, there, no. We, but we'll we, talk, go back to these dip switches. We and, needed to, to talk about that because that's something that, 
you know, each one of those is something we get calls on. We do. And we're a bunch of calls on. You know, the more the more that we can share this information and share it with your customers, um, the quicker time that we can get back to the people that, you know, have an actual, you know, bigger problem or something else going on. So um, the dip switches on the outdoor unit. So the only one that I would recommend that anyone worry about um, is number one. And it's just the, the uh, tonnage. So number one switch is going to be either two ton, three ton, or four ton, five ton. And it comes default three ton or default five ton. It, so it, it's doing... default to the model number of the unit. So all they have to do is move the number one switch the opposite direction of the way it is if they're changing it to the lower two or the lower four. So in the, uh, in the PowerPoint here, you can see the dip switches. It doesn't matter that they're upside down. The only thing that we need to know is on and off. And that's why we've made the quick start guide and redid these so that it says on up here and it says dip here. So we just know that that is on and this direction is off. So we labeled the, the dip switches themselves. And so if it's towards the words on, it's on. If it's the other direction, it's off. It doesn't matter what orientation it is. On the 36K, uh, 60K, um, it's default in on. So your default is 36 on, 60 on, and then just move it to off to change to the two and the four. The other dip switch number two, and it's just dip switch number two. Now, when I first started looking at these, I had the uh, <laughs> I had to email product management and get the service manual, and it had the the black and the white uh, squares. Well, there was no indication of which was the switch position. Was it the black position or the white position? Right. And so, we had, <laughs> well, I had just had to play around with it. I initially thought that defrost was a combination of these, but it's not. So number two alone controls your defrost and it's either standard, which is on, and strong, which is off. So I don't see any reason to utilize that unless you're in the colder areas where it gets down below zero quite often. Um, well, we're high, uh, where, you, where you're in an area where you have a lot of what, high humidity. inclement weather. High lake effect wind, snow, high humidity and cold snow, at the same time. Yep. Um, situations like that, uh, North Dakota, uh, upstate New York, um, Canada, is some of the areas where we see this, you know, needing to be uh, changed to the strong defrost. And while we're talking about defrost, I want to highlight or talk about some of the other things we've ran into, because even though it's off the subject of the switches, but. Um, we've had some scenarios up in northern climates, also in Canada, where the complaint is that it's not defrosting properly and the whole back of the machine's freezing up. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have found is when it was going into defrost, it would thaw the coil, but that grid on the back, and that's all it is, is just a wire grid, was holding on to the ice. Holding the ice, yeah. So the coil would defrost, but the grid would hold ice, and then it would go through more and more cycles like that, and it'd, it'd get it'd to the up. point where it would actually would stay froze up because of the fact that the grid's holding the ice. So yeah. if you're in a situation like that, what we found is just remove the grid because it doesn't really provide any real protection yeah. or anything like that, but it could actually cause you some uh, freeze-ups. The other thing that we found, and I read a big article that Cree put out, because they had done, and Daniel was talking about this yesterday, where they actually had enough water freeze up in the bottom of that unit and smashed the coil. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I can see it in the bottom of this unit. When we move this camera over, I'm going to move the camera so you can see it. But we need to make sure none of those drain, drain plugs are put in. Yep. Because it's, that's what their solution is, and they've tested it, and it shows that as long as those aren't in there, 
and with the base pan heater in there, that yeah. water will shed away from the machine, and you won't get that ice yeah. buildup in the bottom of the machine anymore. Yeah. So when we move yeah. this camera over, we're going to have to shoot, because this is a, I was I, looking down, and I'm like, man, that's a clear shot of that. So I, I had a contractor call me in, so he was, it wasn't that he was wanting to drain it out, so he wasn't using the plugs, but, you know, it, they've got it on the stand, whatever they're, snow level is that they are required to put the stand to and what he had done the customer was complaining because the the ice the water would drain out it would freeze and then it would build up and they oh. didn't want that ice build up underneath the unit it wasn't affecting anything but they just didn't want it there so what he did was he bought one of those um plug-in uh, mats that you put on the walkway in front of the door that's oh. warmed and he just put that under the unit plugged it in and that way when the water hit, hit it it would shed and go away instead of just building up where it dri drip. Oh, that's a good idea I never so, thought about that and so. you know he was asking me if, if there was anything if, if he could put the plugs in there and then drain it you know yeah, that would have made matters I told him that would be worse than if yep. it did build up underneath the unit so, all right, uh, defrost mode. So you still got, yeah. These are, these are the uh, three and four switch. So that is, this is slides label, labeled wrong, but. Uh, yeah, it's not so defrost, it's, it's not defrost. operation. <laughs> this is your uh, energy saving strong mode and standard mode. So in, in the quick start guide, it explains how you can utilize these to do a half ton. So if you want to use these to do a two and a half ton instead of a three versus two, or if you want to do a four and a half ton versus four and five, then you can utilize these modes to do that. So your energy saving mode would take it down around a half ton. Strong mode would bump it up around a half ton. Um, but generally speaking, I would just leave it in standard. Um, unless you give us a call and go through it and see, you know, maybe we need to change it. So I haven't had a situation where these were necessary to change so far. The only other one I saved for too would, or can recommend would be energy savings mode. If you're, if you're in the southern climates and you're dealing with high humidity issues that'll help with that's the a, yeah that's a really good point it affords then, longer run times you, you want to make sure that your blower is not running too fast as yeah, well again now so you want to target that 325 there you go versus 350 make sure that your air is moving slower you know, i don't even care if they go down a little you know i say 325 but even if you got down around 315 it's fine. I don't think it's going to hurt that machine at all. So if you got humidity problems and you're trying to get better dehumidification, now go ahead and slow the blower down some more. Just you know, you got to watch the operation. Just remember, so. it's not a dehumidifier. Right. Nope, it's not. No grease system, unless it says dehumidifier on it, is designed to dehumidify. Right. So I like to point that out because I've had several instances. I had a guy call me of, of I don't know, a couple of years three, four years ago. And he had a GRE unit installed in St. Lucia or somewhere like that. And he was complaining about the humidity. And basically by the end of the call, I explained to him he needed to go get a dehumidifier. Yep. It's not, yep. just because it will remove more moisture than your normal conventional system, doesn't mean that it's a dehumidifier. Yep. So, so and the, and the unfortunate thing is the air handler doesn't give you the ability for a dehumidification mode, uh, but you can, like I said, slow that blower down a little bit more. I, I still don't think you're going to hurt that machine. I, I would honestly probably tell you, don't go below 300 CFM per ton, because you still got to be moving enough air for heat mode, and we don't have any yeah. issues there. Yeah. But you know, the multi-pro system's the same way. We can slow those down some more to get better dehumidification as well. Yeah. So, because yep. they're inverter driven units. So the other thing you got to gain here, and even more so with Multipro, is the Multipro has thermistors on, on the coil in, in and out thermistors. So it, it's going to control itself so that basically it's got, it's got built in freeze protection. So here, 
not as much, but you still have that pressure transducer that is looking at that suction pressure in yeah. cooling mode. So, but you got to be careful too, and we've talked about this. So, if you get it slowed down too much, you could force excessive oil returns. Yes. So yes, you could. <laughs> poor airflow and freeze ups to this machine is also going to force um, excessive oil return. That's two thing. Two things that we see on the degree outdoor unit, and because it's given an error code out here, or because this outdoor unit is performing poorly, the technician tends to focus out here, when in fact it's the airflow in here that's causing Correct. the problem. What we've seen with, with poor airflow with the indoor unit is that you're gonna, I've had this call several, several times, especially um, uh, Florida seems to come to mind, um, uh, excessive oil returns and H4 codes. Yep. So in, in cooling mode, you get excessive oil returns and it'll show uh, 09 on the display. That is oil return. And then um, in, in heating H4. mode, it's H4 because it's an overload. Your coil, your fan is not removing enough heat out of the system. So then it goes into H4. So then your uh, head pressure gets too overload. high. When the head pressure gets too high, the amp draw on the compressor gets too high. Yep. And, and for whatever reason, the machine fall, falls out on H4 before it falls out on anything else. Yep. could fall out on another code. It could fall out on an E1 uh, high but pressure. Normally, it's going to go out but on it, H4 first. It hits H4 And I've first. actually demonstrated yeah. that with this machine by blocking the airflow so much in heat mode. And let that it actually run. forced it to run and, and give me an H4. Yeah. And it was because of poor yeah. airflow. Yeah. So, and you can actually watch it if you put a set of gauges on it. We don't have a set of gauges on this machine today, but I sat there and watched it. The head pressure just kept going up and up and up and up. And I want to say I was probably close to 500 pounds of head pressure before it went into H4. Yeah. yeah. So, and I don't remember exactly because it's been, I don't know, six months or so since I've done it. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Daniel here, and uh, I've got Greg here with me as well. Um, looking forward to answering some of the questions. We've got a lot of good questions so far. So uh, let's jump into those. Um, let's see what we have there, Greg. All right, throw them at me. All right. Uh, first one from Steve. Uh, I'm trying to find out the annual kilowatt for the four-ton Greeflex system for my Solat guy, maybe solar guy. Okay. What do you um, think? It's, it's a good question. It's a tough question to answer. Um, and I guess I, I got it. I got a little analogy I use for that. I don't take offense to it, but it's pretty hard to answer that question because it depends on how the machine's going to be used. Very much like when you're driving down, you know, if you got a if you own a car and you know you got a nice fancy sports car, you know how much gas you're going to burn in that car. Well, it depends if you're going to run 100 miles an hour down the highway or if you're going to always drive 55. You know. Same thing here. Um, it depends on the location of the unit. In other words, are you in a really cold climate area where you're constantly going to be heating at zero or below zero, you know, causing that unit to run longer cycles at higher hertz to reach the heating cap capability of, of satisfying the load inside that home? Are you in a more mild climate where you're typically heating from zero degrees and above, you know, all of that plays a role into how many kilowatts a year that unit is going to be using. So, and then questions can be answered by doing a little homework. So if you go to our website at greedcomfort.com and go under system documentation and you pull up under, under central air is where the flex products are located on our website. And if you go there, you will see that there are extended ratings which will give you the kilowatt usage of that machine at all different temperatures outside in heating mode and your kilowatt per hour that's used at different um, uh, cooling temperatures as well. So it all depends on the load of the machine. It has a lot to do with the load calculation, the BTU requirement inside that house and, and you know what conditions that unit's gonna be subjected to versus a, another unit like, you know, if, if you compare it to 
like north and south, you know, somebody up in Michigan versus somebody down in Georgia, your kilowatt usage is going to be completely different in heating season than cooling season, right? So anyway, so it's kind of, there's not a simple answer there. So. Well, thank you. Thank you, Greg. That's uh, a lot of good information. Um, so Craig, uh, let's see. Craig is asking, um, considering doing a change out of his existing split uh, and putting in a flex, um, he wants to leave the high efficiency furnace since, uh, let's see, it's not that old. What are the system requirements to put the flex with an existing furnace and coil, which is a great question. You know, there's um, just a couple little things that we need to make sure <clears throat> that we do. One is uh, make sure that the coil that's there has a TXV, right, Greg? Yeah, that's one of them. Um, and I have no idea the age of the system, but I would tell you, in my opinion, if you're going to do that, you're going to leave the indoor system. Are we planning on replacing the coil? If we're not, he's going to leave the furnace. But if we plan on leaving the coil, was it a 10A coil to begin with? If it was an R22 coil, my recommendation with that coil needs to go about that. Oh, most certainly. Start with a new coil. That, and then are we reusing the refrigerant lines? Or are we using existing lines? If you're using existing lines, make sure you clean them thoroughly. Because we don't want any kind of... Um, um, debris that might be in the line set because the flex doesn't use filter dryers. They do have strainers in them, but you don't want to start the system up and end up plugging up a strainer. So, and then as far as the requirements, like you said, Daniel, yes, you need to have a TXV. It needs to be at least a 13 seer rated evaporator coil. I, I no micro channel coils. No microchannel coils. I don't want a coil that's, you know, a, you know, typically in 10 sear days, the evaporator coils were much smaller. We need the capacity of that coil. In other words, we need that larger size three ton coil or four ton coil or whatever it is we're doing. If you're going to replace the coil, I would encourage that we use a coil physical dimensions that match the furnace. If not, make sure you have a proper transition between the furnace and the coil. So we direct all that airflow properly through that evaporator coil. And then lastly, some few other things to keep in mind too, is we should actually be using a furnace with an ECM blower. It's not really, it, you really need to make sure we're gonna move the right quantity of air and, and ECM is gonna get you there faster than PSC will, in my opinion. Uh, there's always room for argument. I'm not saying there isn't. Uh, a lot of guys are, are, are stuck on the, want to keep the PSC motors and I can understand some of that as well. Um, but then the dual fuel applications. So you have to use a dual fuel capable thermostat. In other words, you got to make sure that in no time is that furnace and the heat pump going to be able to run at the same time. It's got to be an either or. And then um, and now whether that dual fuel capable thermostat has an outdoor temperature sensor or not doesn't matter. As long as it's when it stages out, is it's only going to be the furnace or the heat pump. Doesn't necessarily have to have outdoor temperature, but a lot of your dual fuel thermostats now use Wi-Fi and use the ambient temperature within the cl closest weather station or weather. And a lot of times you can set your lockouts from that. So there's nothing wrong with doing any of that. So, uh, and as far as defrost goes, there's no reason why you can't hook up that D slash W terminal. And we call it that because some of the machines on the flex units, it may say W1 outside or it may say D outside. It's the same terminal if you follow it up to the board. Right on the plug-in on the board, it says W. But D means defrost. So if we send that signal back into the indoor unit, even with a gas furnace, yes, you can turn on the gas furnace during defrost. But I want to caution you that by the time that furnace gets through pre-purge, pre igniter warm-up, and so on, that defrost cycle is probably going to be over because the defrost cycles on the flex last about two minutes. So you can hook it up if you want. There's no reason why you can't because when you're in defrost on a heat pump and you got a gas furnace running, all you're doing is adding heat to the evaporator because we're back in cooling mode, which is going to further speed up the defrost process anyway. So it's not going to hurt a thing. So anyway, I think I covered all the things <laughs> to worry yeah, you, about. You covered you covered that. 
It sounds a little Most certainly. It sounds more painful than it really is. But I encourage. Yeah, just a people. just a few things there that we need to make sure that we we follow. Um, all right. So uh, uh, Stuart's asking a couple of questions, which I think you just answered one of them. Um, but one is, why is there a G uh, terminal on the outdoor unit? Well, if you've noticed uh, on the outdoor and the indoor units, the terminal blocks when the Flex first came out, that was they were identical. So they're just using the same part. Um, and that way the product cost us less money because they're using things that they already have. So the G is not think, necessary on the outdoor. I think we should tell the truth there. The real reason is because Grease English ain't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then on the, uh, uh, the next question that Stuart asked was, why is there no W on the outdoor unit? Well, there is a W. There's a W1 outside. If you, if, if it's not labeled W1, it's labeled D. And it actually, that wire goes to the board where it says W1. So that's your defrost signal. And the next question, um, Drew's asking uh, for the air handler unit, what's the max size filter and MERV you can run on these? He was told only run a MERV 8 one-inch filter. What do you think, Greg? Well, so... Yeah, one inch filter. I mean, if you're talking about using the filter within the air handler itself, you know, I don't really like to talk about MERV rating so much. I talk about the static pressure drop across the filter. Mm. As we talked yeah. about in this training, and, and if we haven't covered it yet, like I can't remember the whole video, um, we will be talking about it if we haven't already as far as blower setup measuring static pressure. Right. Right. As long as our total static pressure stays in check, I don't care what filter you use. You can use whatever kind of filter you want. But I can tell you Bubba Merv 8 in a one-inch filter is going to have quite a bit of static pressure drop across the filter itself when it's clean. So right. as I mentioned, or, or maybe I haven't mentioned it yet, <laughs> I just reviewed the video yesterday. You think I'd know the timelines by now. <laughs> I don't remember. I slept since then, but... Um, I mentioned in the video, I'll talk about it again now, um, every single airflow product in, in ductwork design and in, in, in air handlers that use ductwork and stuff like that, every single thing has a static pressure rating drop across it for a required CFM. So in other words, you should be able to find the information on what your static pressure drop would be across the MERV 8 filter one inch. If you're using a media filter, what your static pressure would be across like a five inch thick filter or a four inch thick filter for that MERV rating. Uh, individual evaporator coils, all your manufacturers give you your static pressure drop across that evaporator coil, wet and dry. Um, and then, and I don't know if I mentioned this video or not, just in case you guys need to know, and I believe in some of the documentation is there. If you're doing a static pressure drop across a flex air handler and it's wet, in other words, running in cooling mode, you have a wet coil. Your correction factor is 0.96 or 96%. So whatever your CFM calculation comes up to be, multiply that by 96, and that's your actual airflow delivery when you're doing a wet coil static pressure drop across the air handle. So, yep. again, it really doesn't come down to what MERV filter I should be using. It's all about what the static pressure drop across is for the required CFM you're trying to deliver. And finding that sweet spot, as I've talked about before, somewhere between a 0.4 and a 0.6, or even a 0.3 to a 0.6 total static pressure drop across that air handler, knowing we're removing the right quantity of air of around 350 CFM per ton. Good so. stuff, Greg. So, um, you know, if you want to use a MERV 8, you may have to, instead of a 20 by 25, you might need a 40 by 45. To get the airflow you need. <laughs> yeah, Merv 8s really don't Whatever. have a huge static drop across them. Um, um, that's actually a pretty... Or a I don't Merv remember 13. what the static drop is across it, but they're not bad. But So, uh, David, uh, David's asking a question here. Is there a part number for that clear plastic uh, breaker cover to upgrade the older Flex air handler units? I'm not sure, but reach out to your local... Uh, uh, Gree rep, and we may have some 
I know when we first initially said, hey, we need this on here, um, we ended up getting some from somewhere uh, just for the time being till the factory sent the next shipment with it on there. So uh, there may be we some. Should, we should available. be able to locate that part number for you. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. And then David is also asking any forecast for VFD blower motors for better dehumidification using T-STATs with dehumidification? I think that's an excellent question. And I think that Greg is is more than qualified to answer what the solution is for this. You know where I'm going with this, Greg? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't know of any plans that GREE has to give it a dehumidification mode yet, as right. of yet. Um, it's been brought up to them before. We haven't got there yet. Doesn't mean it's completely off the table, but as of right now, I don't believe there's plans for it. Um, but there is a way to kind of circumvent that a little bit. So on your outdoor dip switches, if you set that to energy savings mode, that's going to force longer run cycles, which is going to give you better dehumidification. Other thing to that is make sure your total CFM is at that lower end around 325 to 350 and not 400 plus. Because right. if we slow the air down across that coil a little bit without going too far, because we don't want to freeze up, you're going to make the coil run colder in its normal cycles. And you're also going to, if you put it into energy savings mode, you're also going to force longer run times. Which will end up removing. Now, keep in mind, and I stress this to no end, you know, air conditioners get a large capacity of cooling capacity out of dehumidification. But keep in mind, they're not dehumidifiers. So if the house has a real humidity problem, there may be other things that need to be addressed as to why are we getting so much moisture into the structure to begin with? And how can we combat that? Or maybe the system needs an EV, the EER, I can't even think, speak today, ERV unit, which is designed as a dehumidification unit for the, that can be ducted to the system that will, its primary focus is to remove nothing but humidity. Right. So you got real humidity problems in structures. We can't always simply rely on the air, con air conditioning system to do the, all the work. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Greg. So uh, Luke is saying, uh, maybe you're planning on touching on this, but will the Flex Ultra lock out after negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit outdoor temperature, or will it continue to run? And if not, have you found a T stat that will lock that will lock it out at negative twenty two? From what I understand, the negative twenty two capability is just the lowest tested temp, not necessarily the lowest temp the unit will run. So that is correct. It's not. It doesn't have a hard cutoff. You know, it's going to continue to lose capacity as the temperature drops. So you know, under negative twenty two, it may not make sense to continue running. You may want to use your well, other other heat source it depends on how you're looking at it so it depends on what that auxiliary heat source is that's, that's where very it really true. plays a role because remember your capacity is going down because it's colder outside but so is your overall load on the unit and the amp draw is going down so you're still getting a decent amount of btus off of it for the kilowatts you're actually using to produce heat so if your backup is electric heat I would not encourage a shutdown to the outdoor unit. I would keep that machine running and let the auxiliary heat help it out. Just like any other conventional heat pump, that's the way they typically work. The heat pump will run, auxiliary comes on the second stage, and then when we get closer to set point, auxiliary drops back out and the heat pump continues heating. Now, it may not be able to make, you know, keep up with the load. That's why we keep bringing the electric heat on and off throughout the cycle, uh, uh, trying to keep the temperature satisfied in the home. Now, if you are doing dual fuel and you have natural gas, or, or even if you're on LP gas, now it depends on the efficiency of the furnace, what fuel you're burning, and the cost to that fuel, and where that breaking point is, what they actually call is balance point, which I have no good numbers for you, but if you do your homework, you can kind of figure out that balance point. There is, you know, if you do some search on the internet and stuff like that, there is good articles about balance point and how you determine that balance point as far as 
how many kilowatts an hour you're burning using the heat pump versus how much, how much you know you're paying per therm of gas. Put it that way. Okay, so there's no real perfect answer there. Now the other thing I'll tell you is, in my experience, I spent less time worrying about that and more time worrying about my customer's comfort level. So if they're if they're telling you that it gets down around five, 10 degrees outside, yeah, you're still getting a decent heat off the heat pump, but if the cycles are so long, it makes the house feel cold, that kind of thing. And you have that gas backup furnace, don't sacrifice their comfort. So maybe your cutoff would be zero. Maybe it's minus 15. I don't know. It depends on the furnace too. It, like I said, it depends on the efficiency of that furnace. So there's a lot, what I'm trying to tell you is there's a lot of things to consider there as to where that lockout temperature would be. And in dual fuel, you definitely want to put in a lockout. You just got to decide whether, you don't have to put in a lockout, but you got to decide whether you want, which, you know, which one's going to make the customer happier is what I'm getting. And not have high utility bills, not have high gas bills, but also stay comfortable in their home. So that's the magic trick that we rely on <laughs> you guys to do. We let the contractors do that. To figure out that balance point. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Greg. Good. Really good explanation on that. Um, next question. And we've we've got a lot of questions in here. We just want to say we appreciate your guys' involvement. It kind of really drives this. And and we we love all the questions and love the comments. Um, so keep them coming. Uh, David says, uh, curious of the failure rates or the flex rotary compressor as they run very hot. What do so, you think, Greg? First of all, I want to say we don't have a, a large compressor failure rate. I'm not going to say we don't have compressor failures, but we and, believe... and just just to let you know, I was just pulling the numbers on that this week, and you know, looking at warranty numbers on compressors, it's it's very very low. It's it's less than one percent. Okay. That's so, excellent news. I didn't, a, I didn't even know that. So yeah, just just a little tidbit there. But the failures that we have experienced, I believe, is more about compressor warm up. So Nick, our our video guy, the video master behind everything, I'm gonna have him throw up our our sticker here. That and I don't know if this is the final draft, but it kind of shows you where you're at as far as your eight hour warm up goes. So that sticker, if I, all right, hang on one second. Cause he's, he's sharing it with you guys. He's not sharing it with me. So anyway, it's all good. I got it. So, but basically what we found is guys are not necessarily warming that compressor when they're installing it in cold climate applications okay yes so as you can see from the sticker if it's above 50 degrees we just want power applied to that unit for an hour then you know go ahead and you can start that machine up and then if it's uh, 32 to 50 degrees two hours 14 to 32 degrees four hours below 14 degrees that's when yeah we really need an eight hour warm up or as close to it as possible okay the reason why I say that is, you know, as close to it as possible is, you know, maybe it only takes you four hours to do an install. Okay. That's great. Um, I've, I was never that fast, but, you know, I'm a pretty big boy and I don't move up real fast anyway. So, but the very first thing we would like you guys to start doing, and, and I'm guilty of it too. Whenever I did installations out there, the last thing I ever did was apply power to that outdoor unit. That was the very last step in the entire installation process. We're trying to get you guys. To yeah, because you don't want to. You don't want to get shocked like I did earlier. <laughs> yeah, if Daniel's working for you, you might want to just finish the install, <laughs> power it up, and come back and start it the next day. <laughs> anyway. What we're trying to encourage you guys to do is actually get power applied to it first, get the disconnect all hooked up, get power applied to it, then do your piping and that and that sort of thing. That's going to allow warm up time. And as quick as you get your vacuum done, you're holding 500 microns and you're ready to open up the service valves. Again, keep in mind what I said before. You have, if you're using a flex air handler, you got service valves inside, you got service valves outside. You have to pull from both ports. 
It's the only way you can evacuate both lines because you can't pull through to the indoor coil. That coil is charged with refrigerant. So make sure you pull from both. Once you got your 500 microns, you're ready to open up the service valves. Go ahead and get them open as soon as you can because what you're doing there is not only do you have power applied to the unit, now you've released the refrigerant out of the machine. You're still warming that compressor. You're giving that liquid refrigerant someplace to go rather than sitting in the compressor. And that's where we believe some of our failures have been is because these things hold a significant amount of refrigerant in that system. And it's very good possibility. Well, I know there's I know there's liquid refrigerant in there when it's in cold weather. So and we just experienced that when we were pumping down um we absolutely when we were did. the last training we did, we were recovering uh just an outdoor unit, recovering refrigerant out of it on a damaged one, and the the accumulator just completely iced up. So did the compressor. Compressor did too. And yep. we were scrapping the compressors and I really couldn't get that thing to quit off gassing. Now I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't putting nitrogen in it or anything like that. It was literally just a scrap unit, right? So we pulled all the refrigerant out. We cut the refrigerant lines loose off the compressor. I couldn't weld that thing shut to scrap it until the next day because it was that thing was just nothing but frost and took quite a while for it to finish off gassing so that I could get that thing to break shut. So that's just one example. That, and that's in a, a heated, not really a heated warehouse, but not a cold warehouse. You know what was it? Maybe sixty degrees in the warehouse. Oh, it was it was probably sixty five to seventy degrees in there, right. and those units had been in that warehouse for at least a week. Right. <clears throat> so, anyway, I hope I answered your question there to yeah, get a better yeah. understanding of how important it is that yeah we do need to warm them up and but and I believe I've seen that question in there too. You know, eight hours seems extensive. Well. So now you kind of got go. a good good new rule there right. to follow. Right. Okay. Well, and and hopefully that answers uh appreciate the comment, Spencer. Um, you know, is there a chart or guide for the preheat cycle? Uh and talking about that. So hopefully we covered that for you. Thank you for putting that in there. Um next, Andrew, why not redesign the dip switches to something less confusing for the average tech? They are dinosaur technology. Hence, probably 90% of your service calls. Andrew's my man. Like, I I, I think we'd get along. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think, Greg? <laughs> well, he ain't wrong. But yeah, he's... a lot of the old guys like me, we still like the dip switches. So, because I went and looked at an air handler for my neighbor just the other day, just helping him out. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I don't run service calls anymore. I'm done with all that. I'll let you guys do that. But anyway, it was an air handler where you had a Bluetooth to it to set the airflow. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, I ain't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I can't flip a dip switch, I ain't doing it. But, you know, I'm old school, so, you know, I kind of like the dip switches, but I can see the younger generation liking more of the Bluetooth technology. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd love the Bluetooth, phone, you know, but then – but then you're adding you're adding cost to it and and then there's another i mean so one one i think you'd be adding cost to update it although they could do just a jumper right you could do like a set of pins it's it's the same thing it's doing the same thing as dip switches just a set of pins and you could move jumpers um or we could have bluetooth which would then add to the cost of naturally um but Something you also got to remember is it's a lot of times it's difficult for the factory to really understand how we do things. Um, we do things a lot differently here in the States than anywhere else. Most of the world, they don't care about duck work. Um, they're, they're really huge on duckless markets. Um, so we, we do things old school and dip switches is one of them. So, <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Okay, um, thank you, think... Andrew and Sam. Um, a good question here regarding the dip switches. Uh, if someone needed a two and a half ton, would it work to set it for three tons, put it in eco mode, or set it for two tons, put it in strong mode? What I would do is I would set it for, um, I would set it for three ton and just do that eco mode. And it actually yep. gives a description of that in the manual. So if you look 
Um, I don't know if we let, did we leave it in the quick start guide, Greg? I don't think it's in the quick start guide, but it is in the manual when you're, when it's talking about setting up the dip switches, it gives you a description of setting the half tons. So it says you can use strong mode or, or eco mode. I actually did that on one of my installs was I replaced a two and a half ton Goodman and I left the indoor unit and coil. Um, so I just replaced the outdoor and it was a two and a half ton and I just set it to a uh, three ton and then put it in eco mode. It's been working great a couple of years now. So, um, all right. Um, see, we've got quite a few more questions here, Greg, do you, uh, you I think we do one or two through? more and then let's do one or two more Save and the rest let's for get the back end. to the okay. rest of the production. Yep. So uh Paul says uh once you have your static pressure uh where in the blower air handler do you adjust the airspeed to match your static the dip switches? I guess. So you're not you're not setting the air handler to match your static. You're looking at your static and looking at the blower chart. To see right. where your adjustment needs to be, where it needs to be set, because they are fixed speed motors. So it's just it's just like, okay, so a fixed torque ECM blower motor, which is what the flex air handler uses. It's not variable speed. Okay, it's ECM, but it's not variable. Okay, so variable, you would make you would set it for a specified amount of CFM. This is fixed torque, meaning it's just like a PSC blower. If you have an older machine and you pull up an airflow chart for an older machine that has a PSC blower and you measure the static across it, it'll tell you at that static, it's delivering this CFM, and you make your adjustments from there. So if your static is high, then you need to turn the blower down. If your static is low, you can turn the blower up. But, you know, that's where you've got to figure out, okay, I'm running this static, let's say 0.5, and I'm delivering a 1,000 CFM, and it's a two-and-a-half-ton machine. I'm right where I want to be. If if it's a 1,000 CFM and I'm at three-and-a-half ton, then I'm short on airflow, right? So I don't know. You, you may be able to speed the blower up. Without your static getting out of cur out of hand and getting up to that one inch of static where we don't want to be, you may be able to adjust it if your duct works adequate. But if you adjust that that dip switch settings and your static is is getting up to that one inch mark, you've got to make adjustments to the duct work so that that blower is capable of delivering the CFM you're wanting to, to deliver. So it's not a matter of Again, it's not a matter of you set a CFM and get the static to adjust to it. You've got to you've got to measure your static and see what CFM you're delivering, and that's what. And, and the Quick Start Guide does give you those blower charts, and I believe that is in the next segment of the video is where we go through all that. Yeah. All right. Um, one last question uh, here from Drew, and then we'll get back to the the video. Does the system have an oil recovery mode or refrigerant recovery mode? So it it does have both, actually. Um, now, the oil recovery mode is is what I would refer to as oil return. And that is actually something that you will get if you don't set the blower up properly. You'll get multiples because it's that's going to limit. About the next video segment as well. It, so. We're going to get into it. So it, we're, we're limiting... Um, the compressor hurts if we don't have enough airflow, right? Exactly so then it will go into multiple oil returns because after the compressor runs for a certain period of time at a lower frequency or speed, then it's going to recognize that it has to ramp up, do this oil return to bring that oil back from the indoor coil so that it continues lubricating the compressor. The other Because with a variable speed compressor, you have you can be running anywhere from zero hertz to seventy hertz, right? About the most I've ever seen one run. But anyway, at those lower hertz, you got lower velocities of the refrigerant flow. When you have lower right. velocities, you're not going to pull the oil back. So what the machine has to do is ramp the compressor up to a higher hertz or speed, so we increase the velocity of the refrigerant flow to pull the oil back to the compressor. 
That's essentially right. what's happened there. It's different than a than a standard unitary product where the compressor has only one speed. Because it's always pulling oil oil, oil back. But on a ver and, on inverter driven, it's not. And if if you are ramping that compressor up into full bore, let's say 70, 70 hertz, and doesn't it make a lot more noise when it does that? And if you're yes. doing constant oil returns because you're yes. running at a lower yes. a lower frequency and it, you have so your poor airflow is ending up, you have a noise issue because now it's like the homeowner is asking, why is it exactly making this, right. all this noise every hour or every 30 minutes? And I have taken those technical support calls. And that's what it was. It was inadequate right. airflow causing excessive oil returns. And, you know, I'm not going to try to get off topic too much, but again, this don't apply to just flex. It depends, applies to any inverter driven unit using a ducted indoor unit. So if you're right. doing mini splits and you're using a ducted, um, a duct, ducted uh, slim unit, duct indoor, slim duct, that same rule same applies. Rule. You've got poor airflow right. to that slim duct, you're going to get excessive oil returns on that mini split. Exactly. Same thing. So. All right. Yeah, well, I think we should get back to the video so we kind of stay in our time sequence <laughs> and then we will definitely come back to questions afterwards. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. So, on the slides, uh, we have the startup checklist. And I'd like to take a moment to kind of focus on um, the, the startup checklist as well as, and I don't have it in this PowerPoint, but talking about the uh, job site form. So your startup checklist, first of all, they need to verify that the system is operating properly. That goes back to setting your static pressure correctly, actually having a manometer to set the static pressure. A lot of guys don't, they just assume it's factory set and they, you know, hey, it's working, we're good to go. So your startup checklist is going to be, um, you know, an overall system view of how it's operating. We actually added this into the installation manual for the Flex. Um, and moving forward, we're going to have it added to our other installation manuals, any that haven't been updated. Um, so, you know, installation date, model number, serial number, outdoor model number, serial number, the company name, contractor name, who installed it. Um, L1, L2, your 24 volt um, uh, blower motor, electric heater if installed, uh, supply external static pressure, uh, set point at thermostat, supply air, return air, indoor ambient. All of this information can be kept in a file, in the customer's file at the contractor's place. Um, they can give a copy to the, to the homeowner and that way we have a starting point if there's a problem. And I don't know about you, but I have never actually received one of these because nobody's willing to take the time to make sure it's operating properly. They leave the job. If it doesn't work, then all the alarms go off, but there's no information for us to paint a picture of how it was operating or in the case that there is a problem and we talk about the job site form, no one fills out the job site form. Without the job site form and the technical data, actual factual technical data, we're unable to assist any further. We're, we're at a stopping point. We can't go any further until we have enough details to paint a picture of the entire system, not just this outdoor and you know, measurements or whatever and pressures, but a picture of the entire system together. So pictures, uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. Pictures help, but then pictures and technical data, I guarantee you we can solve an issue in well, then, half the time if we have the proper data. Also, if they have proper operating data of when they installed the unit, and then a year down the road or two years down the road, it malfunctions, they got a reference to say how the machine worked when they installed right. it compared to what it's doing right. today. Right. That's only going to benefit and shorten their service time down as if well. You, if you hand me a startup sheet, then I can rule a lot of things out before we even get started. Right. Um, and then if you if you send me a, a job site sheet, then we've, after sitting down and reviewing it, it's just for an example. 
the debug on the multiprobe, you were able to use that, look at the temperatures, and determine that the system was low pressure without yep. ever going any further. Yep. And you knew what it was. So w that saved how much time? Having to get the gauges yep. out, hook them up, you know, on the phone, trying to get these things. Unfortunately, with the flux, we, we don't have that ability. But, yes, you're right. You know, if you got the data behind it, you can decipher what's going on. We, we can solve pretty much anything. The, the other thing that I will also add to that is with that job site sheet, you know, we talked a little bit in Multipro at the beginning about um, uh, load calculations. And, you know, I don't care if you're installing this on a 100-year-old house. There needs to be a load calculation when you go to do that, regardless of what system's there, regardless of, you know, what company installed the ductwork in the beginning, regardless of any of that. Um, the contractor should be doing his due diligence which is why they're licensed contractors in making sure that what they're putting in is going to work properly for their customer. I can't disagree with none of that. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's get into uh, flex troubleshooting, and we'll go through the most common things that we've run across in uh, measuring the test points um, before we move the camera over here. So. And we're going to talk about this in a little while when we get to mini split training. Um, but uh, the retainer clips on the Molex connectors, they have to re be removed before we can get the Molex connector to release. So the, on the slides here, you've got the red clip there. Use a pocket screwdriver and just pop up each side. It'll pop off of there. Just make sure you throw it in the garbage or whatever. It doesn't have to go back on there. And then if you're removing any stake on, all of the green ones tend to have a clip. So you pull the insulation back and you'll see the clip that actually goes into the hole on that stake on. Yep. If you don't if you don't push that press on that clip, it is not going to release. So Uh, on air codes, these, uh, as we were talking about yesterday, there's different air codes on the, on the flex compared to the multi-pro compared to the mini splits. Some of them are similar on the flex and the mini splits, but it's important to, I recently had someone, um, they had an H3 code, uh, I think H3, no, H6. H6 on the mini splits is indoor fan motor. So the, the technician was already going down the troubleshooting route of what's wrong with my indoor fan motor. Well, on, a, on the outdoor flex unit, it's not communicating with the indoor. So the only thing that it can be talking about is fan motor the here. outdoor fan motor. So yep. an H6 on this is going to be outdoor fan motor. An H3, uh, an H5 is the same. Um, uh, I think L3 is... is H five pressure. and H seven are the same as they are with the with the mini split. Um, you do have a lowercase e one, that means high pressure sensor, which is high pressure sensor error, which is talking about the transducer. Um, I haven't seen that one, and Neither. honestly, I doubt. I don't think you'll ever see you'll a ever pressure see transducer one error. because your pressure transducer is located inside the cabinet. It's protected from the weather, um, so. And I've been dealing with pressure sensors for a long time, and usually when a pressure sensor fails, it's to do the water gets into the socket. Yeah. Other than that, they're pretty reliable. We don't see a lot of uh, pressure sensor errors. Um, so the other thing I want to go back to that slide for one second. I want to make sure I point this out. We talked about it yesterday. I want to point it out again today. So there is a code H4 for mm -hmm. overload. Mm -hmm. There is no overload. Mm -hmm. The overload is the inverter board picking up the fact that the compressor is working in an overloaded condition and yeah. throws the H4, the H4 code. code. So, as we talked about yesterday, there's no overload underneath yeah. on top of that compressor. Yeah. So, And I'm not touching anything down there today to find <laughs> out. <laughs> so, so, just wanted to kind of recap on that. So there when, isn't one. When I see an H4, um, I'm, I'm not thinking about compressor temperature. I'm thinking about inability to expel heat. 
or that's how pump, I or pump properly uh, or pump properly. That's what comes up in my head is is I'm looking for why can't I? I'm creating heat because it's a heat pump. Why, why am I, I not expelling it? it? Yep. So then that leads me towards the indoor. Um, same thing as as a, a an H5 basically. I'm I'm overworking the compressor and I'm unable to expel whatever heat that I'm trying to get rid of. Yep. So. All right. Um, I'm gonna skip on forward. So step back a minute here. So that's on the blower motor. I want to make sure I point this out. Um, so these numbers are not verbatim. Uh, so if you look at that uh, wiring schematic of the blower motor itself, and if you highlight that. Yep. So the main thing we're looking at there is the FG, which is the blue wire. And then you got your yellow wire, which is your PWM. So what that means is that's a, the PWM is a pulse with modulation signal. That's what's telling that motor to come on. The FG is the feedback voltage from the motor telling the board the motor's actually functioning. Right. So if the motor's in default or if it's in a shutdown, you're not going to get that FG signal. The only thing you're going to get is the PWM signal telling it to run. The FG signal is not coming back because it's not coming on. It's locked out. Right. Okay. So, or actually, I'm, I said that wrong. You won't even have the PWM signal if it's in a lockout. So if you reset power, turn it back on, then you should get the PWM and the FG once the motor starts. So in what we're doing here with the meter leads and everything, I just want to kind of point that out. So really what we're doing is between red and ground. So the red lead is on uh, ground. Is on ground. The black and then the is black on lead is common. on common. You should have uh, zero volts there. Then between the red lead being on FG and black being on common, you should get some sort of a pulse voltage. I don't even care if it's an actual. It doesn't have to be a number. It just needs to be. It something. doesn't have to be 8.53. It may it not be, be 15.25. I'm not really worried about all that. All I want to know is do I have a voltage reading there? Right. And then the PWM, again, red lead on PWM, which is the yellow wire, and black on common. I should get some sort of pulse voltage telling that motor to run. And then your constant voltage is the white wire and common, which is your constant 15 volts. Now, that should never change. It should always be there. Yeah. And that whole troubleshooting tactic that we're talking about right there, we'll talk about again in a minute. I'll get a close-up shot on, the, on this motor as well. That fan motor in the outdoor unit is exactly the same thing. Yep. It ain't any different. And any five wire motor on any of this mini splits is basically doing the same thing as well. So the whole yep. troubleshooting procedure doesn't change on the while, five wire motor. While we're talking about this, um, so if you unplug the fan motor from this board without powering it down and making sure that the DC bus voltage is drained down, then you're going to get a spark. Yep. And it could damage the control board. Come to that meter right behind you while we're talking about it because this yep. unit's powered up right now yep so just like that diagram showed sorry about that just like that diagram shows the red and black is your high dc bus so if i go right here to red and black i got 294 volts kill the power before I unplug that I want that voltage all the way down and it's not there yet I'm getting there I'm at like 14 volts 10 volts 7 volts 4 volts 3 volts it's kind of hard to see probably from there but I mean, now, now I'm going under three volts. We're probably doing pretty good, and I don't have the retainer clip on there. Now I can unplug that motor. I've actually had a guy on the phone where I told him, like, power the system down, measure that voltage. When it gets down to basically zero volts, now you can unplug it. Well, he turned it off and unplugged it right away, and it, I can tell you right now, we had a bad motor to start with. <laughs> and then we had a then bad had motor a bad and board. board. <laughs> 
So I can't stress that enough that you know we can't be unplugging and plugging things into these boards with power still on it. And even though you kill power, it doesn't dissipate immediately the voltage go immediately. Away. Right. Same with the inverter driver board, which I'll get to in a minute when we get back here, and you can get a better. I'll have the camera shining on that. So these they got to slow down a little bit when you're talking about an inverter driven kit equipment and DC powered equipment. So Before you put your hands on it. Also, on this board, I'll point this out, you'll see the capacitor on that board. So the DC bus for the blower motor, or for the fan motor, sorry, is powered off of this board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you blow the fuse on this board, we know we have no DC bus to feed that motor. Then the fan won't run. And the fan won't run, and you'll have no display. Right. Okay. Even if you install a new fan motor... And we've had where the fan motor has failed, mm -hmm. has blown the fuse. Yes. But we unplug the motor, put the new fuse in there, it powers it back up. If, as long as we don't plug the motor back up again, we can test the output voltages off of this. The board is usually still good, but we just need to change the motor. Right. So, it's kind of that, this kind of stuff we've learned from guys calling yeah, in yeah. and actually troubleshooting actually the unit. Actually going through so, it. Yeah. Um, at least that's been my experience with it. Normally, the motor, when it fails, it doesn't take the board with us. It, it right. might blow the fuse, but it doesn't wipe it's not out the board. not going to wipe out the board. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, and that, that fuse is actually replaceable on this one. Yes. Um, it's not on the drive boards. No, no. no or the filter boards. Yeah, but this one's replaceable. It's right. the same on the indoor, the right. BH indoor board. And that's it's something else to mention, well. So, it, cause, and I actually I didn't bring it up when we were talking about the air handler, but I'll bring it up now. So there is a fuse on the indoor air handler board, but that is a line voltage fuse, and a, a lot of unitary product, you're used to having a low voltage 24-volt fuse on those boards. Those boards do not have 24-volt fuses. So I've told guys many times, like, you know, when you're doing your install, get you a little three amp fuse and Add a couple one. of spade connectors and put a put a fuse on the R R circuit. Yeah. So if you have a short yeah. in your thermostat wire or something like that, it'll pop the fuse yep. and we don't hurt the board. So but it does not come from the factory with a low voltage fuse. These are the old style kind of car type, but they're slow blow. They're not glass. But it's a five amp uh two hundred fifty volt. Cool. So all right, E1 and E3 error codes. The E1 high pressure protection, which honestly, I haven't had one on the Flex outdoor unit before yet. Um, it opens at 667 and closes at 551. Um, multiple trips before it actually causes a lockout. Uh, could be anything to do with uh, a restriction or a clogged fan uh, coil. Um, the E3 low pressure, this is what we were talking about yesterday, it opens at 7 PSI and closes at 22. So Good it's basically a I'm out. Yep, it's I'm not, out of hey, I've got low pressure. <laughs> yep. So the E4 compressor discharge high temp, um, the, that is reading from the compressor discharge temperature sensor. So if you get an E4, um, when the when high discharge temperature is detected, the compressor speed will limit will limit itself to protect itself. So if your compressor is limiting itself like that to protect itself, you could end up with oil returns, right? Well, the one thing I like to talk about when we talk about discharge temperature on a compressor, there seems to be a lot of confusion with service techs in the field understanding what high discharge temperature off a compressor means because they're relating it to high pressure. Hmm. They're thinking condensing temperature, not discharge temperature. And there's right. a significant difference a between difference. your discharge temperature and your condensing temperature. It doesn't mean high so pressure. This is before the change of state. Yeah. So if you're getting high discharge temperature, could it be caused by the compressor being overworked, overcharged, stuff like that? Yes, it can but more likely it's caused because we have total, your total low side superheat is high 
and then along with the heat of compression, that becomes your discharge temperature. So if, you're high, if you have high low side superheat, you're going to have high discharge temperature, which relates to restriction, overcharge, or undercharge, undercharge. Um, yeah. you know, lack of feed of refrigerant. We're not getting <coughs> excuse me, the cool refrigerant gas back to the compressor. That's what's causing our elevated discharge temperature. So yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation with a contractor on the phone because they don't understand the difference between discharge temperature and condensing temperature. Right. Right, because because generally speaking, you're thinking high temperature equals high pressure because of the exactly. pressure temperature relationship. So I've learned that over the years of being a TSA that you know you got to rein them back in so they get a better understanding of what that thermistor is actually reading. So and that's why you'll see in a lot of instances, and I've seen it in unitary product for years, they not, may not have a low pressure switch but they have a discharge temperature. That discharge temp temperature of the mister is acting as a low, as pressure, low pressure switch. switch. Because if your discharge temperature is getting too high, yeah. obviously the low pressure is too low, right. whether it be because of an undercharge or restriction or right. a TXV that's not feeding right or an EEV that's not feeding right. It doesn't matter. At that point, you've got, so you've got high superheat. Just to, to <laughs> clarify <laughs> as far as error codes go, E1 or the E4 could be triggered by the discharge temperature sensor because it's just reading temperature. Because I've gotten a I've gotten a high pressure code off of the discharge temperature right. before, and and when I when I knew that's what it was, it was because the temperature was reading the thermistor was out of range, and it was reading. It thought it was like two hundred two hundred fifty. Degrees, it, and we don't have, see a lot of thermistors out of range, but the potential's there. It does happen. So, so if there's anything about this machine while we're out here working on it that you don't understand or you want more information about, please hit that ask a question button. Give us a question, and we'll see what we can't do about zeroing in on that particular yeah. issue. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Don't don't uh, don't be hesitant about letting us know that you're there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so um, the uh, the sensor codes. The only way that you're ever going to get a sensor code uh, is if the sensor is failed open. It does not know if a sensor is just simply out of range and reading the wrong temperature. It has way it has no way to know that. It's just a, reading a resistance. So if you get a sensor code, that's pretty much the only code where I can say you're going to need a part. Um. EE memory chip error. Uh, have you seen one of these on a no, Plex it's, before? It's, it's, I've had this on mini splits before. Um, I have found that uh, um, your your temperature sensors could be out of range on this code. Um, now, generally speaking, what it means is the software in the board is corrupted and it can't read the chip it can't read the chip and so which would be now's a good time to talk about it <laughs> while you got that powerpoint up why don't we zero in on that on that jumper cap yeah yeah good point so I'll highlight that right so there. your jumper cap right here this is one of the few outdoor units uh on the flex and mini split line that has a jumper cap on the outdoors. And so when they get a replacement board, it's not it gonna will come not with come it. with a jumper cap. Nope. And they you forget got it. to make sure that they move that jumper cap yeah. from the old board and install it on the new board. Yep. Now that's pretty much across the board on indoor boards. Anytime you're changing an indoor board, they're gonna be moving a jumper cap. And but there is select product, as I pointed out with MultiPro yesterday. Some of those boards Some have outdoors. have the uh, jumper cap. And this thing, this machine definitely has that jumper yeah. cap. So, yeah. kind of a word to the wise there. Was any thought of including the quick start guide with the install manual? We have discussed that with product management, and that I didn't is know we did. Okay, that is our wish, but it's it's difficult. I see. Um, we were just having this discussion yesterday because we opened a three VIR, and it has a little pamphlet in there with that unit and this is a newer a newer one like a b revision 3vr 
So we opened the, the package and it had Wi-Fi module installation pamphlet inside there. The Wi-Fi is already built into the 3VR control board. There's no need to have that manual in there. So yeah, it, it, there's a little bit of difficulty in, in getting them to put what we want in there and not put what we don't what shouldn't go and part with of that, that model stems from the language barrier it it's does tough to get that it, across exactly what we it want. does and also you have to remember that they have different teams that do different things so a lot of times the customer facing team um, that we are able to communicate with is completely separate from the team that packages things and puts them in the box right, right? So not only the language barrier, but the time it goes through one team to the next team to the next team, it kind of gets lost in, <laughs> no right. pun intended, translation. I think we woke everybody up here. <laughs> um, so, and I appreciate the comment, Jay. Um, stop doing such a good job and there might be more questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Jay. I'm glad you were able appreciate to join that. us. <laughs> so... Um, so Mike with Capital Group, and I actually like this too. He says, we have the kick, quick start guide as a line item on an order, and it's sent out with all orders. Oh, that is awesome. I like that. Ah, that's cool. So so it's, they've got it set up like as if it's a part number, and it just goes It goes with, with the unit. Yeah. That's awesome. I, that's I like great. The, that's a great thought. It's a great so. idea. Um, so where were we? Uh, H4 uh, air compressor overload protection. I think we covered that pretty I think we've pretty good already. Um, so H5, 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 H7, HC, LC, startup, PO protection. So I want to. I don't want to answer that right now. You want to get the camera over here? No, I want to talk about that when we talk about inverter design and setup because that okay. all pertains to that. Okay. And that's the next segment we got coming up, which will give you a better understanding of why you get H5 codes, why you get H7 codes, and, and that's and those codes of light. And so. the, the reason why a lot of the training kind of meshes together is that the Flex, the Mini Split, the Multi Pro, it's using an inverter board, it's using uh, an inverter compressor. So it all kind of meshes together with what we're talking about. So I am going to throw a question out right now since I'm getting some good feedback and some good questions. So I'm going to get a good question out right now. Okay. And so inverter driven compressor. Whether it be the Flex, or it be a Mini Split, mm -hmm. or it be the Multi Pro, mm -hmm. is that motor in that compressor AC or DC? That's the question. Are the motors AC or DC? Good question. And we'll see what kind of responses we get back from that. All right. So, well, um, I think we went over the H6 DC fan error pretty well. We talked about the, uh, you know making sure the power's yep. drained off of that. P6 main control board and di driver communication error. What this is talking about, if you've ever dealt with the U-match line, this, the flex is, we don't, we discontinue the U-matches, but there's a lot of them out there because we did sell them for quite a while. If you've ever dealt with one, the flex is set up just like a U-match, uh, outdoor itself. So when you get a P6, which means communication error, it's not talking about communication with the indoor or the outdoor. It's talking about the outdoor unit control boards unable to communicate with each other. On the Flex 36 outdoor control, uh, outdoor unit, we have a, um, a separate communication board in between the main board and the inverter board, which you'll see when we move the camera over here. But communication has to pass from this board through the the connection the, board connection board i was thinking pin board but yeah yep. thank you the connection board and then to the inverter board that's how the two communicate so if that's not working you're going to get a p6 you can uh, do a test on these the power switch on the drive board may have failed um, check communication wire between main board and driver board which passes through the connection board on this one, the uh, four and five ton, it does not have so that built board. Together. It's built together. So you will see the same components. It's just built into the dry, the inverter board. So um, you should have 3.3 .3 volts 
You can check this voltage on the drive board coming out of that communication board. It should have 3.3 volts uh, DC going um, between the one and the other. Now the P7 driver module sensor error, basically the module is talking about the inverter board, not the main board. The module temperature is shorted or open, it's overheated. Um, the drive chip is damaged. Basically, if you get a P7, you're probably gonna end up replacing a uh, inverter board. Now P8, driver module high temperature protection. This is basically means, and we're gonna do a great example of this today, um, but the P8 is basically, if you replace that inverter control board, you had one code, you replace the board, now you have another code, you didn't do the, uh, the thermal paste properly. Um, just another reminder, be careful, you've got high voltage DC on that as well. And I've tested that myself. If you don't have a meter, <laughs> or if you do have a meter, it takes up to 15 minutes for that to completely, board to completely drain out of that control board. The voltage. Yep. Um, PA, AC current protection, compressor running at high load, high line, vo high line voltage, or a failed drive board. Don't forget, and we'll talk about this in the mini split training when we get to reversing valves, don't forget the place to start, start with the basics. Right. What's L1, L2? Right. And don't measure L1 to ground and L2 to ground and tell me you've got 240. Make sure you're measuring L1 to L2 to see what you actually have there. I can't tell you how many times I've had them test L1 to L2 and we end up with 120 volts. So PC driver current error, basically driver chip or current sampling circuit failed. And then PL, the uh, low voltage protection. Um, you're gonna see that across the board on the flex and the mini splits. Basically you have lo low line voltage or your bus, your bus voltage is low. So your, your board's not creating bus voltage or your input voltage is improper. I see that a lot of times when you mix match a 230 volt and a 115 volt unit. Um, on the flex unit, it's, it's going to be referring to the board. There's no indoor unit to match with. Could be a load on the board causing their DC yes. bus to drop as well. It could be. So, and, like a and grounded that's a good or a point. shorter compressor. So, so a shorter compressor, uh, open winding, uh, fan motor. Uh, open winding on the fan motor, anything that's connected to the board that could be dragging down that DC bus voltage. So at that point, to troubleshoot it, you would kind of have to unplug components. Unplug if you unplug the component where, and the DC bus goes back up, then you know you what to... You just the, unplug the component that was dragging it down. Right, right. And I use that to troubleshoot a lot with these types of machines. All right. Um... So I don't know if you guys, if the camera was on Daniel when I did it or if you just heard it, but he was making me nervous. So I killed the disconnect because his hands were flying all around that unit and I didn't want another smoke show like yesterday. <laughs> did I scare you yesterday? <laughs> so he was making me a little nervous because he kept pushing down on this top pan and right underneath it is the reactor coil. And I'm like, all right, how hard is he going to push down on that? So... <laughs> <laughs> he was making me a little nervous, so I killed the disconnect. Thank but, you. I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> I would kind of like to keep him alive. Uh, anyway, so, but I'm the same way. My hands go flying and everything when uh, I'm trying to talk. Or you're crinkling a water bottle. <laughs> but I do want to answer my question that I asked here. So I had a couple comments, and I don't like throwing people under the bus. So, But the ones that said, D.C., don't go to Vegas because you're wrong, and if you're a betting man, you'd have lost a lot of money, right? <laughs> so, because if it was DC, then I wouldn't be able to take the amp draw on the compressor. It is absolutely AC. Now, and I will show you that when we do the inverter design and everything, and I do have the power back on now, so. Okay, I'm, I'm watching. <laughs> so, but in a minute here, I'll get, we're going to turn this machine on, and I will show you with an amp probe that, because if, if, it, if it was a DC motor, I wouldn't be able to put an amp probe around the compressor wire and actually measure the amp draw to the compressor. Unless you had a uh, meter that reads DC a amperage. Yeah, but you got a wire in series. I do happen to have. So, 
But let's get this camera over here because there's some All things right. I want to point out to this. And I'm going to put the amp probe on the one of the wires to the compressor. So a couple things I want to talk about here before I turn the machine on. In the one picture there, give me a something to point with. Okay, hold on. So, <laughs> oh, you don't want to get shocked either? No, I really would rather <laughs> not. Let's use something insulated maybe. That would be great. Let's see here. Let's, how about that? That's fine. I just won't touch. So right there, just underneath my screwdriver, is that DC bus where you, if you now, and, I, and I've had guys do this on the phone, but I have them rig up some, some wires or something coming off of it so their meter's away from it when they do it. But right there, you can measure that DC bus voltage come off that inverter drive board. Here's that fusible plug. Just pointing that out. Right here is the pressure transducer. Uh, I think Daniel mentioned it yesterday. In a minute, I'll pull the camera back and show you where you can actually take voltage readings off of that. Um, I believe black is common. I've actually, um, hold on just a second, Greg, and I'll, I'll get the slides lined up with what you're talking about. So, so at the moment, the slide that I'm showing is talking about where we're testing that DC bus voltage. Okay, yeah. So and, right there. and how to troubleshoot the drive board, um, actually testing the IPM PFC circuit, which is, uh, in the past, I, I call it troubleshooting triage. So um, most of the time, you know, I'm in a hurry. I'm trying to get to the next call and make sure everybody gets taken care of. Um, so I'll get to a point and then I would, I would learn that I know enough to where I know I need to replace that. But in recent uh, past couple of years, it, just getting more detailed and investigating it more and learning from Greg about how to actually see if that board has failed um, this is the test that you would do. Do you have anything about this slide that you wanted to add? So the, there we're showing you the where you measure the high DC bus. So before we do this test, we need to make sure that voltage is all the way down to zero. Correct. Remember we said 15 minutes or so, but or, or you can measure it. Once it's down, then we can go ahead and follow the procedure. And, and I know I got it spelled out there in the PowerPoint, so as you can kind of click through the slides there, let's focus on the slides for just a minute. So go back one. So it tells you, you know, um, set the meter to diode, and then it gives you the procedure of, of testing the board. PDU should be 3.3 .3 to 0.7. P to V should be 0.3 to 0.07, and so on through the whole thing. Now, don't worry about memorizing that. You don't have to have the PowerPoint. It absolutely is in the service manual. That's where I got it from. So all it was all copy and paste into the PowerPoint. So, and we're going to actually show, we'll do whether, this on a board. Whether you later. do that with in diodes or if, if maybe they have a meter that doesn't do diodes, but it does mega ohms, and that's what that other note's about, you can do the same test procedure in measuring the mega ohms. What you're really looking for is just inconsistencies. You'll have, you know, a, a specified, you know, ohm, ohm value, and then it it'll match and the match, same. and all of a sudden you're going to hit one that's like way off the chart. Now, if you go through it and all the ohm readings are identical, going through that whole step by step, N to U, N to V, and just like you would do the diode test and you don't ever see any inconsistencies, then you know the board is not the problem. So whether we do it in a diode test or we do it in a um, uh, ohm test, either way is going to prove to you whether that board's bad or good. Right. So uh, what else we got there as far as trouble? Um, so I wanted to go back uh, to the, the pressure, pressure sensor transducer. that you okay, were talking about. So here's about. the pressure transducer. Now I'm going to show you this on the front of the board in a minute. They could do it if they had a part. You could put a meter lead right in here and do it right on the wires. So black is common. So black and orange, that's your 5 volts output. And then black to green is going to be your voltage according to what the pressure is on the machine. So um, when the machine's running, in a minute I'll get the machine up and running and we'll move back and you can actually take the volt voltage readings right on the front plug you know they don't even have to have the top of the machine or anything off 
Now, Gree's never given me a good chart that shows, you know, what they should be at every single pressure. That's why I give you examples there of, you know, 125 PSI is at 0.9 volts. That's about a 40 degree evaporator coil. And then when you get up to around 350, 400 pounds, we're at the 2.6 and the, and the 3 volts DC. So you can kind of see as the pressure goes up, so does your voltage feedback from the pressure transducer. Again, I don't think you're really ever going to see failures with the pressure transducers. I really don't see that, but and they should be relatively close to what the gauge is saying. But it's just that's just good information to know. As far as the reversing valve goes, I like to point this out, make sure everybody is aware of this. The coil is a 230 volt coil, and with with degree products that I've dealt with. We don't see reversing valve failures, almost never. No, we don't. We just don't see it. I don't know if it's because we're using a 230 volt coil and we get that much more voltage on it to throw that slide over. But if anybody that calls into our tech support team and is saying they got a bad reversing valve, we're going to dig in hard because more than likely that's not the problem. There's and we, else we going do on. not want them to, to go through all of the trouble of replacing a reversing valve and just to find out that it wasn't and yeah, and that wasn't it so uh and then you know the evs we're going to do an ev test out in the other room um we already talked about the fusible plug so i think now let's move this now oh he mentioned about the p6 code now and it's hard for me to show you on camera but the boards are actually marked on the board specifically where you should read the 3.3 volts at. So they don't have to remember it. All they know is they need to check for it. And they can measure right on the board. It says it on the front of that board. It says 3.3 volts. And my uh, team, J.D. and John Richard, um, they are utilizing that to to test with. Um, they're, they're having good success. And that way we're not just going, okay, I'm not sure, replace main and inverter board. Um, we know which one it is that's not working properly. And if I can get Nick to bring that camera over to the left a little bit more, I'm going to point out that reactor coil. Um, that reactor coil is simply, you know, it's just a, a, it's like a transformer, only it doesn't have induced from one coil to another. It's just one coil, and it's a simple ohm reading. You know, it should either be open or, you know, basically zero ohms. So zero ohms. Across it, you got a good coil. If you have infinite resistance across the coil, then the coil's open. But again, that's another component that we just don't see fail very often. Yes. Yeah. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're ready to uh, get in to answer your questions. But before we do that, I have one other thing I want to share with you guys, and then I want to talk to it because I think it'll give you some really good troubleshooting advice. So I'm going to have Nick roll that. I think it's only about two minutes. It's not real long. Um, but let me let him play that, and then we'll get back to – I want to talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get into your questions. Hello, Greg Brunts with Gree. How does an inverter-driven compressor work? The diagram shown here helps give a simple explanation to that very question. Line voltage powers the bridge rectifier that forces alternating current to flow in one direction, creating DC voltage. Then the capacitors on the inverter charge and discharge effectively, boosting the voltage to what is referred to as high DC bus voltage. This high DC bus voltage can be measured on many inverter boards. This voltage on a 230 volt unit will be more than 300 volts DC. Then from the DC bus, the voltage is fed through the IGBTs, which is insulated gate bipolar transistor, effectively a switch. The voltage passes through the IGBT to compressor winding terminals W, U, and V. The IGBT switches work in pairs. For example, power comes from P through the IGBT to the compressor wire W and completes the circuit flowing through compressor winding to U through the diode to N. At the end of that switch cycle, then the power comes from N through the IGBT to U, completes the circuit through the compressor winding to V through the diode to P. The IGBT will rotate the power through the IGBTs to W, U, and V, 
from both positive and the negative side of the DC bus, effectively creating and controlling its own electrical sine wave. The speed at which this happens is the hertz, allowing the main board to control the speed at which the compressor runs. This is what makes the compressor variable speed. The speed at which the compressor runs is determined by the main board programming and input from the thermistors, pressure sensors, and other components within the system. If you found this tip helpful, be sure to like and subscribe to see more videos like it. With Gree, we are by your side. All right, so we're back. So the reason why I shared that was because I felt like in the video that we that Daniel and I are doing in the lab there really didn't cover what I really wanted to cover as far as why you want to know that why you want to and how we can troubleshoot the compressor so um and we get the question all the time you know we've had people ask what is the lock rotor of of the machines and I want to be very clear they don't have lock rotor as you can see, we're creating our own three-phase sine wave, and these machines start very much just like a uh, variable speed or even a, a fixed torque ECM blower. They they start real slow and they ramp up. The reason why you guys want to know that and understand that as technicians is because that's what's going to help you understand whether or not you have a compressor problem or an inverter driver problem. The MyGBTs in there is what sends the signal to your UB and W windings. So as long as the compressor windings are good, then there's no reason why we shouldn't see amp draw on those wires. Because even though the video talks about it being a DC bus, that is an AC three-phase compressor. So by taking that DC bus and creating our own three-phase sine wave, or way Gree does it, I should say, not us, but they are actually creating that three-phase sine link wave to run an AC three-phase compressor. So now that you know that, now you understand that you're going to own that compressor out no differently than you would any other three-phase compressor. So if you disconnect the wires going to the compressor, you should have equal ohm value between those wires. So if you go U to V, U to W, B to W, it doesn't matter. Your ohm reading should be around 0.5 to 2 ohms. And they should be equal within about a tenth of a percent. You know, so if you get 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, I would call that a good compressor. But if I get 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 1.0, there's something wrong with the windings of, those, of that compressor. The other thing you want to do is take an ohm reading from each one of those terminals to ground you should have an infinite resistance reading. Now, many times you will read mega ohms. If you read mega ohms, that's a normal reading. Do not state that that compressor is grounded when your meter is showing M ohms or mega ohms, because th that's not true. Because the way the oil is in the compressor and the motor windings and everything in there, it will conduct through the oil to the compressor shell and that's why you're getting that mega ohm reading. So don't condemn the compressor over a mega ohm reading to ground. And I now, just had one of those this week, Greg. Yep. That someone sent me, you know, the 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 picture of the um the of the meter, and he had it set to mega ohm. And then some of the meters are auto ranging, so it automatically right. picks it up in mega ohms. Okay. Right. So I just want to caution everybody out there: don't be condemning the compressors over a mega ohm reading to ground. That's it's not that's not what's wrong, okay? So, a thousand ohms to ground, hundred ohms to ground, zero ohms to ground. That's a problem. That's a grounded compressor. So, back to the video and understanding the flow. If you have a normal ohm reading to the compressor, then that compressor should pull amps on all three wires, and you can take your amp probe just like I did in the video, put it around the wire of the compressor, and get the amp draw. And the way you do this, because it may lock out on a code for you before you get them all three, but the way these things always start, the condenser fan motor comes on first, 30, 60 seconds, you should see amp draw on that wire to the compressor. And then once that fan motor shuts down, you know you quit trying. So it'll try again, move your amp probe to the next wire and repeat the process. As soon as that condenser fan motor comes on, 30, seconds, 30 to 60 seconds later, 
I should see amp draw. It's not going to be a lot, maybe a half an amp, one amp, something like that. It's going to be very low amperage. You might see three or four amps. I don't really care what amperage you see. I just want to make sure you're seeing amps. Now, if you see amps on all three wires and the compressor don't start, that compressor's stuck. That's a locked rotor compressor. Unlike a, a, a traditional unitary product that actually pulls locked rotor and where you get that 90 amps that start up or whatever it is, you're not going to get that on an inverter driven compressor. But you will get a small amp draw on each wire and that tells you that compressor is locked up. Now, if all the windings are good and you're taking your amp draw readings and you don't get amps on one or more of those wires, you've got a board problem. One of those IBGTs in there has failed, and that's why you're not getting the amp draw to the compressor. So another way, another way to determine whether I got a compressor problem or I got a compressor drive board problem. The other thing you can do to all these drive boards, and it's in the service manual, and, I, and it works. You can do the diode test to those boards, and the service manual shows you exactly how to do the diode test to that inverter driver. You can do it on the Flex. You can do it on a Multipro. You can do it on a mini split board. All of those boards, that same diode test, it works exactly the same way. You just need a multimeter that does diodes. So we're kind of getting into this era, guys, where inverter-driven products are going to be the wave of the future. I believe in my heart, and I kind of have an inclination that soon you're not going to have PSC compressors anymore. So you got to get on board and you got to learn how to start diagnosing inverter driven compressors and what they're doing with these inverter boards. So you can look like the smart guy when you go out there and say, oh, yeah, let me do a diode test of this board. OK, the board's good. All right, let me ohm out the compressor and see what that's doing. You know, just and, and it's not going to be just green. It's going to be across the board. I really see this coming. The government's already done it with blowers. You can't buy PSC blowers anymore. You're not going to be buying PSC compressors anymore. And I think that's coming right around the corner. So just trying to share the knowledge that I have and Daniel as well, working with me. He understands all of this. This is how we diagnose inverter driven compressors. So you, you, Daniel, you, you got anything to add, please do. He couldn't have said it better, Greg. Um, and I, you know, I believe you're right as far as the uh you know, it doesn't just have to be Gree. It can be any, you know, be the be the star, be the be the tech guy that walks up to it and knows what he's doing and doesn't just say, well, you know, I haven't seen this before. And, you know, um, <laughs> you know, that first one, that first one you walk up on the Linux <laughs> and you open that panel and, and I'd never seen one before. And I go, oh, no. So as soon as I saw that, I went home and started looking at Linux manuals so that I could know, you know, believe know me, I was there and know what it was too. about, right? Believe so, me, I was there at one time too. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is not how I roll. I'm going to figure this stuff ex out. Exactly. I want to so, know before I get there. Right. Um, so, and so as my, go ahead. <laughs> as my um, uh, tech, uh, tech school teacher always said, you don't have to know the answer. You just need to know where to find it. You know, and there and that's there's something there that can't be more truthful. You can't we can't, can't remember, remember all of this. You can't. You've just got to remember where your resources are to find out the correct you need it. So and that's that's the goal of this is we, we want more resources for for more um for everybody that we can go to and find. And that's a a large part of if you haven't been to our website, go to our website, check it out. Um, we're constantly updating things and adding new features and in ways to not only get in touch with support, but also ways to find support uh, within the web page. Um, so, you want to get over to the questions, Greg? Yeah, we we really need to focus on the questions. So, and let's uh, we we don't want to keep y'all hanging out here too long, so we'll try to wrap it up. So, uh, Gary with Northern Plumbing, um, please uh, reach out to us on that. I'd, I'd love to discuss it. So reach out to tech support um, and we can take a look into that. Uh, Stuart, um, let's see. Uh, John, new install of Flex 60 
it does have a liquid dryer at EVAP. This is not harmful. And we also had another re reference to the uh, dryer, Greg, before you get into that. Um, where was that one at? Let's see. Bidirectional dryers, Char Charlie. Which one was it? Charlie. Charlie? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about the dryers. Yeah, I do want to talk about that, and I want to make mention of stuff. So, you know, if you guys choose to put a two-way dryer on the liquid line, it's not going to hurt it. It really isn't. I mean, it's no different than any other split system uh, as far as, you know, the way the refrigerant flows through that liquid line. So, you know, we're not telling you you can't do it. If you want to put one on there, put one on there, okay? My only caution to that is, and I, and I got a picture here I want to share, so if I can get Nick to pull that up for me, I want to talk about this a little bit. So you'll see in this picture, if you look at EEB2, that's the best example, and right under EEB2 is one of those strainers that we talk about. If you don't, if you look at the indoor coil on the flex air handler it has strainers on both sides of that txv as well okay so if you're using an existing line set and you put a two-way dryer on there that's not a bad thing because if you start it up in cooling mode if there's any debris in there it's going to channel through and hopefully pick up in that liquid line dryer my caution to you though is if you have anything in the suction line it's going to end up in that strainer in that outdoor unit that I'm showing you right there. Your dryer, it's never going to get to your dryer. It's going to get to that strainer right there. If we start in heating mode, we're going to be in the plugging up a strainer in the outdoor unit. That's why I was making the caution of if you're reusing line sets, make sure that line set's clean and there's nothing in it. Because if there is something in it, it's probably going to get stuck up in a strainer well before it gets sucked up in the filter dryer that you added to the system. So, again, put a dryer on there if you want, but don't be surprised if your restriction ends up in the indoor coil or the outdoor unit. <laughs> and also, uh, we did put a bulletin out on that, Greg. Um, you know, just our stance on, uh, you know, sh can we or can we not use a filter dryer? We're fine with it. It's okay. We're not going to knock you for using one. So. All right. All right. Let's get on. So, uh, Stuart says, do you remove filter in system if you have filter grills in duct with filters? I think he's talking about the the filter that comes with the indoor the, unit. Um, the metal, belt, metal filter that basically does nothing anyway. Correct. Yeah, that only catches cats and dogs <laughs> if they go through there. <laughs> You know, I had a salesman years ago explain to me, and he's actually right about this, the way he sold filtration systems to people, you know, where they use a media filter or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He used to take a, um, carry a, a cheap filter with them and a bottle of baby powder. <laughs> and he'd go outside and he'd shake the baby powder over the top of the filter and watch all of it go right through the filter. He goes, now, now let's put a bunch of airflow through that and see how much of that baby powder stays in that filter. He's just oh. effectively what the cheap <laughs> filters are doing for you. And he sold an air cleaner to every single one of those people. Oh, wow. And he ain't wrong. So yeah, he's got, he's onto nothing, something. You get nothing against air cleaners, except for we got to go back to what I was talking about before is you got to be careful to set a crush drop across those filters and make sure that your ductwork is designed to accommodate the restriction you're putting in there with that filter. And and your air cleaner, whatever it is, it's going to have a, a static pressure drop listed for it. Nothing aggravated it. me more when I was out in the field <clears throat> and in the contractor that I was working for, they'd sell these elaborate systems where they're getting 20 grand or better for the system installed. And then I'd go out there to do the maintenance and I pull out this little 50 cent filter and I'm like, my <laughs> God, you sold them a $20,000 system, but you didn't sell them a $20,000 no filter? <laughs> You should have, you know, to protect the unit. So now I've got to be the bad guy in five years to come out and say, oh, well, sir, I hate to tell you this, but we're going to have to pull your evaporator coil out and clean it and put it back in because of this <laughs> cheap filter that was put in there. It bugged me to no end. So, you know, I'm all about proper filtration on systems to protect the unit. So. All right. Um, so Mike says, uh, 
I'm going to say it wrong. <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> uh, sound like me now. Yeah. Can't what say needs to right. be. Yeah, what needs to be evacuated, in other words, is the indoor unit precharged with nitrogen refrigerant. I think we kind of already answered that, but um, yeah, it's it's got 410A on the, the Flex Ultra indoor unit. Now, the Flex in Eco, which is what we're not talking about today, that is right. a different machine, and it does not have service valves. It has nitrogen in it, and Correct. this has also come up, too. Green inadvertently put stickers on those units saying they had 410A refrigerant in it. So if you get a Flex Eco Air Handler and it says it has refrigerant, but there's no service valves, it can immediately tell you there is no refrigerant in it. That is nitrogen. It's just nitrogen. All right. Mike, uh, considering a Flex Outdoor on a on existing uh, Ream Air Handler, is 7.8 suction line size okay? Well, I can tell you the specifications from Gree come at 3834, okay? The first thing I would tell you is if it is applicable, in other words, not too hard to replace that line set, then I'd absolutely replace the line set. Most certainly. Secondly, if you're going to use a 7 8 line set, I'm not going to tell you, no, don't do it. What I'm going to tell you is we have had complaints with noise-related issues from the pulsations from the compressor, especially on 7 8 lines. Now, we've got an uh, article that's going to be coming out very, very soon. Uh, we haven't got it out there yet, but we're going to get it out there about the use of Gree does allow you to use a muffler on that line. And you can also use like uh, line weights, which would be like a mass dampener, hard rubber that wraps around the pipe that helps mitigate some of that noise as well. Uh, and then your traditional vibration eliminators, stuff like that. So... Um, you know, it's just the kind of nature of the beast so much with rotary compressors. I've seen it with multiple manufacturers that sometimes you can't get pulsation noise that's transferred through those pipes to the indoor unit. I've seen it in package units. I've seen it in split units. I've seen it in refrigerators, believe it or not. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind, too. Because, again, I think we're going to be getting away from now. There may be some uh, inverter driven scroll compressors out there. But those will also give you some pulsation noises through the pipes as well. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of think that this is going to become part of the norm for you guys out in the field, that you're going to have situations where you're going to have to deal with noise pulsations through the piping and stuff like that. So we got to get on board with using appropriate accessories to try to mitigate some of that noise. And the other thing that I would tell you is make sure that when we run refrigerant lines, that we're not smashing them tied up against floor joists and stuff like that where noise or vibration pulsations can be traveled from the pipe into the wood structure or metal structure or whatever it's up against. And absolutely we should be using some sort of vibration pads underneath the outdoor unit. And also, especially in cold climate areas, make sure you're elevating these units. They need to be off the pad. They can't be right on the pad. Because if you do that, what happens when these things go into defrost the water doesn't shed far enough away and you start getting what we call ice damming and it'll build up ice around the bottom of that unit and it'll keep stacking that ice. And eventually you're going to get ice build up across the bottom of that condenser coil and it will smash that condenser coil. So mini splits, um, the flex, any of these products, heat pumps that we're, that we're using in cold climate areas, especially need to be lifted off that pad. You don't have to be a ton, a couple inches. You know, I've seen some vibration pads that are like two inches tall. At least get it up in the air some so that water can shed away from that condenser. And then the other thing I'll tell you is all of the units that we sell from Gree have base pan heaters in them. And any of those plugs that come in the packaging, I don't know why it comes, but it does. Don't put any of them in. Let, let that thing just dump the water. I don't want to try to control water at all. I want to just dump it off that condenser and have that unit raised up so that water gets away from that unit when it's in defrost. So, All right. So uh, Drew says, is it 0.4 to 0.6 inches of water column or 0.04 to 0.06? It is 0.4 to 0.6. That is a really good question, and you know it's it's important to see that difference because that's a big difference between zero point four and point 
Zero you know, four. and sometimes you guys ask me these questions, and, I'm, and I <laughs> deal with it day in and day out, and I'm constantly looking at those charts. But, Drew, I'm going to be honest with you. I still went and looked at it again going, <laughs> is that point four or point six? <laughs> but it is point four to point six. All right. Steven says, hey, guys, uh, I just installed a BH in an attic. Of uh, course, a float switch. As usual, we break R. Thanks for the heads up on needing to break Y. So glad, glad that you got something um, that you could use there out of the training. For sure, that's definitely a big deal because you don't want that call. <laughs> oh, you don't. Not on it. Not on a new install. Uh, Steven says, "Does Gree plan on making a 21-inch coil cabinet to fit the dual fuel application? Currently, only 17 and 24 cabinets are available. Um, I don't think there's any plans that we're aware of, Greg. So uh, there is no plans that I'm aware of. But the other thing, keep in mind, guys, you don't have to use a Gree coil." In those situations, you can use another manufacturer's coil. Right. And a lot of those ratings are out there. Like some of them, we know we got some ratings with ADP. Yep. A few other rating matches. So, you know, if you want to use a different manufacturer's coil so you can keep the same cabinet size, I, I can't discourage you from that at all. All right. So Daniel says, uh, hey, guys, where can I see the class again? Um We've got a few questions about, uh, you know, seeing the, the show again. So we will have this uh, accessible from the link that you use to register. So you can go back and rewatch. And then also um, we'll have it posted on YouTube, uh, the Greek Comfort YouTube page. Um, just give us a give us a day or so, but it'll it'll be on the YouTube. And. Um, David says, uh why do you guys have G connected on your low voltage wiring at the Flex Outdoor Unit? Uh, yeah, we didn't wire that one up. I don't know. <laughs> and, and we both looked at each other when we seen the question and said, "Oh, it, did we have did it? Up? Maybe it did. <laughs> I, I don't, don't remember." <laughs> it's a, it's a resting place for that green wire. That's all it is. <laughs> so no, we did uh, not hook that up, and th that lab shared with more than one. Uh, entity that uses it so, yeah yeah you know i've come in there a few times going oh great now i get to put the equipment back together so i can actually use it for a training class <laughs> is what it is all right drew says do you have recommendations on surge protectors for the outdoor unit that's a great question so i will tell you if you go to our talking comfort live recording uh on youtube from last month or the month before i think it was the month before okay so, so february the february talking comfort live we actually uh did an interview with our good friend over at icm controls talking about actually not just having surge protection but also having a line monitor so if it's too high of a voltage it cuts the power to the unit so but yeah we do recommend protection for the systems there are some electronics in there so thank you drew uh marcos he says hey guys uh thanks for the great training details he's got a five ton condenser four ton air handler in several instances the blower stopped working he checked 240 volts uh checked 24 volt green wire everything was okay there uh after reset blower motor comes back works great any ideas what could cause the blower motor to lock out what do you think greg so first of all the very first thing that comes to my mind is we need to make sure since we got a four ton indoor that we are running the unit as four ton not as five ton right just, and i understand the model number might be the same and that's fine i just want to make sure make sure that unit set up for four ton since you got a four ton four ton air handle Secondly, is the voltage applied to the unit. We want to make sure that the indoor air handler is not being applied with too high a voltage. So about 253 volts is the maximum I want to see on that air hand. And then lastly, static pressure measurement, as we just talked about it. If you measure that static pressure, if we are in that line 
of 0.4 to 0.6, and we're not taxing that motor real hard. If you take that total static pressure reading and you're at one or over an inch of, of total static across that air handler, that's why that motor's shutting down. It's shutting down because the motor's protecting itself. They do have a limiter in them that if you keep doing that to that blower motor, it's gonna it's finally gonna just say it's basically saying, Hey, no, you ain't gonna ruin me. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut down on. It. That's what it's telling. Okay. So if your statics in normal in that 0.3 to 0.6 range, and we're not taxing the motor and we are moving the right quantity of airflow for four ton. So I'll just do the math real quick because I can't do math very good in my head anymore. I'm getting old. So you need to be moving around 1400 CFM at four ton. Okay. So if we're moving 1400 CFM and we're right around 1400 CFM and we are our static pressure somewhere between 0.3 and 0.6. So we know it's not high static doing it to it. Then replace the blower motor. It's not the board. Just go ahead and get with your distributor, get a replacement blower motor, change the motor. And and one other thing I'd like to point out, just just to make sure, if you do end up replacing a board for whatever reason on on the flex indoor unit, um, or even the outdoor unit, the the main control board, it's got a jumper on it. So if you forget to move the jumper from the old board to the new board, uh, then it's not going to work. And we've talked about that in many of our trainings. It's we, it's called a jumper cap. It's a little blue or a red plug-in thing, plastic thing. You'll clearly see it when you hold the new board next to the old board. You'll see one has the jumper cap, one don't. And, and that's kind of the golden rule about any indoor boards replaced across the board with GREET. Anytime you're changing a board, always look for that jumper cap. And now it's becoming more of a thing even with the outdoor units, especially with the flex, they have a jumper cap on the outdoor board as well. Make sure you're looking at any board replacement you do inside or out, put those boards side by side. And if there's a jumper cap in the original board, you have to move it to the to the new board. That applies to multi-pro, flex, mini splits. It, it, they're just, that's how they identify what unit that board is being used in because the boards are used in more than one application. Matter of fact, on the flex, that outdoor board is the same for two ton, three ton, four ton, five ton. Yep. Same board. It's just got a different jumper on it. Yep. So, all right. Joe says, uh, miss some of the training. Will it be available? We covered that. Um, Bradley says, uh, when is green making an air to water heat pump? Um, we'd have to reach out to the, the product management team to talk about that. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey says, will the video be accessible? We covered that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, Sam says, uh, will the recording be available? I'm available for, uh, let's see. The East Coast would like to reference this. So yeah, Sam, we covered that. But also, uh, Sam, um, Let's see the distributor that you're with. Um, feel free to reach out to the team um, if you're needing some additional information. Uh, Daniel says, uh, what's the phone number for tech support? Um, in this case, he's located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Feel free to reach out to us. It's 888-850-7928. Um, and just make sure you're prepared with a little bit of information like model and serial things like that. And, and you know, and, and I don't like it to come out as a secret at all. I want you guys all to know we don't take live calls. It comes into a computer board. You will be your call be, will be returned. So make like Daniel said, make sure you're prepared. Leave model, serial number, your name, company name, phone number. That's what's going to generate that call. And as soon as you leave all that in that voicemail recording, you're going to get a text message back. And any more information you can give us, the better. In other words, if you can just take a quick picture of the model serial number tags of the indoor unit, outdoor unit, have all that ready on your phone. So when you get that text message, you can respond, reply with those data tags. The more information you give us up front before we get you on the phone, the more prepared the technician can be for the call. So you may think that is actually becoming, is, it's too much trouble for you. I'm telling you, you want it to be too much trouble for you because the more information you give us, the faster we can get to 
what equipment you're working on and and what your problem is. So name, phone number, model, serial number, of release the outdoor unit. And when you get the text message back, include any other data tags and also a brief description of what the issue is. So that that way, the technician that is going to field that call, it can be prepared for the call when he calls you. All right. Uh, Bradley says, uh, when is, is that the same question? Oh, he's asking when is Gree making air to water heat pump? Oh, he asked that twice. Okay. Um, Stuart, does tech support have a number? And on a flex, does the liquid line need to be insulated? The liquid line doesn't have to be insulated because our expansion device is inside now instead of just at the outside. Outside, so basically, it's more conventional. Your uh, your line set's not an extension of your indoor coil, like on a on a mini split. So, and then to just quickly answer that tech support number again, if you didn't catch it, eight 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 five zero seven nine two eight. And then Stewart's also says, when will the new refrigerant be in the flex units? Um, more of a question for product management. Honestly, I know we've got some R32 rolling out towards the end of the year, uh, some systems, but I'm not sure on the Flex in particular when the date would be to, to move over to the R32. And um, let's see. Uh, David says, is extended 10-year warranty possible with certified Greek Flex installer? With non gree and or AHU and or coil. Yes. You can register yes, just the condenser. So. Yeah. You can register just that outdoor unit. And if you look at the warranty statement, so if you go to greecomfort.com, over to the right-hand side, pull up uh, resources, and then look under warranty, warranty program, and you'll see the statements there. Um, kind of in the middle of the screen, it'll say warranty statements. Open that up. You'll have a few different years that you can look at and click on it and you'll get that detailed information about um, the Grease Select versus standard warranty and that sort of thing. So I already read through a little bit here, Daniel. So Leon with um, Instant Air LLC, appreciate mm -hmm. the question, but we're going to keep this all about flex. That was the multi-zone question. So feel free to reach out to our tech support team and we'd be happy to help you with that scenario you got going on there. Most certainly. All right. And then Drew says, um, we size our duct for 0.1 inch, 0.1 inch water columns that allowable for these systems. So I'll, size I'll, for address, 0 .1? I'll, 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 size, I'll answer that question. So typically, most contractors will supply will size their supply duct 0. 0.6 to right 0. 0.1 inch static that's correct in most returns most contractors sub, um, size their ductwork to a 0. 0.05 and then okay. you still have your static pressure drop across your filter that's also going to play a variable in that. Normally, that's not included in the return ducting sizing. The return ducting size is usually sized to a 0.05. And then the supply ducts, whole supply duct, branch runs, registers, and all that is generally is generally sized to a 0.1 static. So, yes, the flex would fall right into them same rules as long as you're doing there. Then, you know, if you got that, so now you're at 0.15, okay, your total static pressure drop. Or that CFM would be 0.15 with before we even add a filter or anything else. So now we add a filter in there that's got a a, a, a two inch 0.2 inch static drop. Now you're at 0.35 to 0.4 total static pressure drop. That's right where you want to be. So yeah, absolutely. So you're sizing the ductwork really like you would any other traditional system that needs to move 350 to 400 CFM per ton. Again, the flex is more on the on the lower end. We don't need to move 400 CF per ton, CFM per ton. We can do more than the 350. So it, it gives you a little bit leeway for your duct work to be a little tighter than if you were trying to deliver 400 CFM. And I, and you know, uh, Greg, I think to the the point here is 
is that you design the duck work. Well, and, then, and that you're not going to run to... into a problem if you're using the rules of thumb that you have used in the past. If you properly size duck work and properly install duck work, well, the problem I... comes in where it's simply not done or in a retrofit where you replace a three ton with a four ton, but you don't go through the duck work to see where you're at with it. So I'm a realist. I know not every single manu contractor out there is doing a manual J or manual right. D in every single job. I know they're not doing it, but a little common sense goes a long ways. You know, from the area where I used to live, I don't live there anymore. I mean, we almost every home that we ever dealt with had basements. The furnace or air handler was located in the basement. So you got some general rules of thumb that you would go by. And that's what I would do when I was doing service calls or if I was, you know, planning an installation, I'd walk through the house because I generally knew how many registers with six inch duct that I was going to have to have for that tonnage. I knew how many return grills I should have and how many wall chases we should be going down for that to give me enough return air. You know, general rules of thumb, I would measure up the duct work be, to see if I'm even in the ballpark of whether that duct works correct or not, just by a walkthrough. We talked about that in the video, too. Before you do your static pressure measurements, walk the house. Are the registers open? Are your returns open? You know, a lot of these jobs that you guys are doing are retrofit. In other words, you're replacing the unit. Okay, but take the minute to walk through the house. Do we have the adequate ductwork for this job before we put it in? Because to say that, you know, that thing's been in for 20 years, it's a four ton, it's never had any issues, the ductwork's got to be fine. That's going to steer you in the wrong direction real quick. You still need to go through because I've seen units abused for 20 years with inadequate airflow. And then that new system put in and it rears its ugly head real quick that you got ductwork problems. So I would be preemptive to make sure the ductwork is going to be okay before you sell and install that system. Yes. Could you lose some jobs over it? Yes. But do you want the headache of going back? and trying to fix the problems because you put that system in knowing you didn't have adequate ductwork. And that's yep. what's going to happen. So it's however you guys want to look at it. You know, you can fix it before, fix it after, or just <laughs> say, you know what, I don't think I really want to do that job because I know I'm going to have problems. I know that I've, I've done several jobs that I wish I had a walked away from. <laughs> nothing wrong with walking away from a job. There was plenty I did walk away from. Oh, geez. So, so well, we're kind of at the at the top and beyond of the hour. So yep. uh, let's go ahead and repeat that all phone the questions. Number. And so just, uh, yeah, Stuart, ask uh, again, just in case you missed it, the tech support phone number is 888-850-7928. And um, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate all of the questions and all of the participation. Appreciate each and every one of you. And, and thanks for watching today. Yeah, I appreciate you guys all watching too. I'll tell you, to be honest with you guys all, with the involvement we've been getting from these broadcasts that we've been doing, whether it be the Tech 90 or the live broadcast, uh, Daniel and I are happy to do them because, you know, it's we know you guys are staying engaged. It makes right. it worth our time to do these. And again, the, the, the Q and a box will stay open for a little bit longer here. So please, if you got any suggestions of what you'd like to see in future broadcast, tell us what you like about it. Tell us what you don't like about it. And, you know, we're men, we can handle it. You know, if you want to beat <laughs> us up, that's fine. Beat me up. That's I'm fine. We're, it. we're good with it. My wife beats me every day. So it's all good. <laughs> you know, just, be honest with us, and if we can make it better, we will. Um, and like I said, we enjoy doing it. So, again, appreciate you all for um, joining in and into our training. Course. Thank you, everyone. And don't forget, with Gree, we're by your side. Yes, we are. Thank you.